Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, pleased to call this meeting to order. Today is Monday, December 16, 2013. This is a phase one suitability hearing before the Massachusetts Gaming Commission relative to the application of Wynn, Massachusetts, LLC. My name is Steve Crosby and I'm the chairman of the commission. I'm joined today by Commissioners Cameron, McHugh, Zuniga, and Stevens. The entire commission will preside over the hearing and the de and decision of this matter. This is an adjudicatory proceeding which is convened in accordance with 205 CMR 115.04, paragraph 3, and will be conducted pursuant to the formal rules outlined in 801 CMR 1.01, subject to the clarifications contained in 205 CMR 101.03 and Chapter 30A of the General Laws. Before we begin, I'd like to explain the procedural history that led us here, as well as the process that will govern this proceeding. Wynn, Massachusetts LLC submitted a phase one application to the commission. The commission then instructed the Investigations and Enforcement Bureau to commence an investigation into the suitability of the applicant to hold a gaming license in Massachusetts. The Bureau has conducted such an investigation into the qualifications and suitability of the applicant and its qualifiers and generated an investigative report of its finding, findings, which it submitted to the commission. A copy of the report was provided to the, appellant, the applicant by the commi commission. Based on the report, the commission has scheduled this proceeding on its own initiative. I see that a number of lawyers are present here today, as usual. On behalf of the applicant and the Bureau, I will ask that you <coughs> please identify yourself and advise the commission as to whom you represent. On the applicant side. Uh, Mr. Chairman, good morning. Uh, my name is William Weld. I'm a member of the Boston firm of Mintz Levin, representing the applicant, Win Mass LLC. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kim Sinatra. I'm the general counsel of uh, Win Resorts, and I'm here representing the applicant. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman. Commissioners, my name is David Mackey, and to my left is Mina Makarios from the firm of Anderson and Krieger, and we represent the Investigations and Enforcement Bureau. Thank you very much. At the conclusion of my opening comments, this proceeding will commence with a recitation and explanation of the investigative report by the Bureau. We will ask that the Bureau outline the manner in which the investigation was conducted and outline the findings relative to each qualifier. The Bureau's presentation will largely be made by Karen Wells, who is the Director of the Bureau. Director Wells is joined by the consultant who has assisted, who has assisted in the conduct of this investigation. We will allow the consultants to offer any clarification or answer any questions during Director Wells' pre presentation. Any commissioner may ask a question of Director Wells or a consultant at any point during or following her presentation. At the conclusion of the Bureau's presentation, the applicant, through its counsel, will be afforded an opportunity to cross-examine Director Wells or a consultant relative to any information contained in the investigative report or to which they testified. The applicant may reserve its right to cross-examination until the end of their own presentation if they so choose. Next, the applicant will be given an opportunity to present its case. The burden is on the applicant to demonstrate by clear and convincing evidence both its affirmative qualification for licensure and the absence of any disqualification for licensure. To that end, the applicant has already subjected itself to a thorough background investigation, the results of which are set out in the investigative report. Those findings will be considered in determining whether the burden has been satisfied. For purposes of this proceeding, however, the applicant may call any witnesses and present any other evidence it desires in an effort to satisfy its burden. The Commission has directed that, at a minimum, Kim Sinatra and James Stern be available to present testimony as to the issues set forth in the notice of this hearing that was provided to the applicant. I understand that counsel for the applicant had an opportunity to meet with counsel for the Bureau and the Commission to discuss this proceeding. The purpose in part was to clarify some of the issues that the applicant should be prepared to address in its presentation. Those are primarily the issues that are set forth in the written notice of that hearing. Is that conversation correct and did it take place? Yes, Mr. Chairman. The applicant is well content with the procedures. Thank you. While those areas should be included in the applicant's presentation, it may certainly address any other issues it believes may be relevant to its suitability determ determination. Similarly, the commissioners may certainly inquire into any issue that is of interest to us. At the conclusion of each witness's direct testimony, counsel for the Bureau will be provided an opportunity to conduct cross-examination of the witness. Then each commissioner will be afforded an opportunity to ask questions of the witness. Any commissioner may, however, ask any question of any witness at any time. 
during the examination or at the conclusion of the examinations. We will allow a very limited redirect and recross of a witness if it's absolutely necessary. Each party may raise any objection they desire at any time. However, the basis for all objections must be clearly stated. Finally, at the conclusion of all of the evidence, the applicant will be provided an opportunity to make a closing statement summing up why it believes it is suitable to be issued a gaming license and should be allowed to proceed to the phase two portion of the process. Before we begin, I understand that there are a number of pre-marked exhibits that have been exchanged by the parties in advance of this hearing. I'll now ask the Bureau's counsel to introduce the Bureau's exhibits. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, we have uh, pre-marked uh, nine exhibits, including two that we've uh, shown to the applicant's counsel this morning. Uh, the first four are the, the customary documents that we've introduced in connection with all of these proceedings, the notice of the proceeding, uh, the memorandum that uh, uh, explains the process of the proceeding, Director Wells' cover letter, and then the redacted copy of the suitability report itself. And then we have uh, five additional documents that we have pre-marked and that we uh, may make use of during the course of our uh, questioning of the applicants, witnesses, uh, and I uh, don't believe that the applicant has objection to the introduction of any of these exhibits. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Now, if the applicant has any exhibits it would like to introduce, I'd ask that they be introduced. I think ours have been pre-marked, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, we may have some slides this morning. The only materials we have are the um, PowerPoint slides, which we've provided to staff and to council. We have, we have no objection to that. Okay. If either party would like to have any additional documents entered into evidence during the course of the hearing, I'd ask that they be properly introduced and uh, marked by the court reporter. The Commission anticipates that its inquiry at this proceeding will be limited to the matters addressed in the investigative report. In the event that a line of questioning conducted by the Commission or Bureau moves into an area that has not been included in the report, but that is included as part of the investigative file and is material to the suitability determination, the applicant may request a recess in the proceedings so, so as to review the issue. This would be an unlikely happenstance, however, as the Commission anticipates addressing solely issues covered in the investigative report. No final decision will be made at the conclusion of the hearing today. Instead, the matter will be taken under advisement at the conclusion of the proceedings and a written decision issued. If at any point during the Commission's deliberations it determines that further testimonial or documentary evidence is desirable, it reserves the right to ask the applicant to provide such evidence prior to a suitability decision being made. We will now swear all of the witnesses in. Anyone who will be testifying at this proceeding, please stand and raise your right hand. <coughs> Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will provide before the commission at this proceeding will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Note that all have answered in the affirmative. Thank you very much. Before we begin, does either council have any preliminary issues or objections or issues for clarification? No, sir. Councilor? No, no, sir. With that, I will ask Attorney Mackey to begin the Bureau's presentation. Okay. Uh, good morning. Again, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners, uh, we will begin this morning with a presentation uh, by Director <laughs> Wells of a summary of the investigative report that was done in this matter. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission. It was, is with great pleasure that I submit the IEB's 10th and final suitability report of 2013 for WinMass LLC. Once again, I would like to thank the team of Michael and Carol, along with the IEB and Massachusetts State Police investigators for their outstanding work on this investigation. The specific entity seeking a Category 1 casino gaming license in Massachusetts is Win Mass LLC, which was formed in 2011. It is a wholly owned subsidiary of Win Resorts Limited. Win Resorts currently owns and operates Win Las Vegas and Encore at Win Las Vegas in Nevada. Is also the owner of an interest in Win Macau Limited, which operates Win Macau and the Encore at Win Macau in the Macau Special Administrative Region of the People's Republic of China. The other percentage is publicly owned and traded on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. The officers of Win Mass LLC are Matthew Maddox, President and Treasurer, Kim Marie Sinatra, Senior Vice President and Secretary. Those, they also hold positions at Win Resorts and are individual qualifiers. Uh, 
The officers of Wynn Resorts and natural person qualifiers for this investigation are Stephen Wynn, Chairman of the Board and Chief Executive Officer, Matthew Maddox, President and Chief Financial Officer, John Stremp, Executive Vice President and Chief Administrative Officer, and Kim Marie Sinatra, Senior Vice President, General Counsel and Secretary. Members of the Board of Directors who are also identified as natural person qualifiers, John Hagenberg, Dr. Ray Irani, Robert J. Miller, J. Edward Virtue, Alvin Shoemaker, D. Boone Wayson, and Elaine Wynn. The Wynn Las Vegas operations consist of approximately 186,000 square feet of casino space, two luxury tower hotels with a total of 4,750 hotel rooms, suites, and villas, 35 food and beverage outlets, and other luxury shopping locations and services. The Macau facilities include 265,000 square feet of casino space, two luxury hotel towers, with 1,008 hotel rooms and suites, eight restaurants, and brand name shopping, spas, lounges, and meeting facilities. Wynn Resorts is also currently constructing Wynn Palace, which is described as a full-scale integrated resort in the Kotai Strip of Macau. Wynn Mass LLC is proposing a 350 to 500 room luxury hotel in Everett with average room size of at least 600 plus square feet. Multiple, multiple restaurants will flank the casino and provide outdoor terracing overlooking the Mystic River and have spa and high-end retail space. Gaming is planned for a 150,000 square foot casino with 250, pardon me, 2,500 to 3,000 slot machines, and 100 to 150 table games. The project plans for lush landscaping to create a resort atmosphere and essentially an urban location. The report gives an overview of Wynn's operations in uh, both Las Vegas and Macau, including security operations, surveillance operations, and their compliance pro program. The Win Las Vegas has received only two citations from the Nevada Gaming Control Board during the past three years, and neither violation resulted in a fine. Win Las Vegas self-reports incidents of underage gambling to the NCG, uh, pardon me, NGCB. During 2012, seven incidents were reported, and during 2013, 10 incidents were reported. The Win Las Vegas liquor license is current and is in good standing with no violations during the past three years. The Win Las Vegas AML Compliance Program, that's anti-money laundering compliance program, was reviewed and found to be very thorough. The report itself details an investigation into the sellers of the property for the proposed site. As I summarize the concerns for the commission on Friday, I will not review those facts again. As far as suitability for Win Mass LLC is concerned, I do note two things. Number one, the investigation confirmed the applicant was not complicit in the unidentified concerning conduct. And number two, when approached by the IEB about the concerns, the, active, the applicant proactively sought to remedy the situation so the sellers would not receive an enhanced price for the property based on gaming use. The report also details the ongoing controversy between Wynn and a former major investor in the company, Kazu Okada. The two parties are presently involved in litigation surrounding Wynn's action to remove Okada from the company after concerns arose regarding Okada's dealing in, dealings in the Philippine, Philippines and potential violations of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Okada included a counterclaim uh, in the lawsuit that the SEC had commenced a formal inquiry into, Macau, into a Macau University donation. The IEB confirmed that in July 2013, the SEC announced it had terminated the investigation and found no wrongdoing on the part of Steve Wynn and his companies. The IEB also confirmed the property of the donation had been fully vetted by the company before it was made, including legal advice approving the transaction. The Wynn's claim and Okada's counterclaims are still pending. With respect to Macau, when Macau opened in 2006 and has undergone subsequent expansions, the latest being the encore at Win Macau in 2010. Win, Win Resort's entry into the Macau gaming bar market has been a financial success. Since it opened in 2006, Win Macau operations have been the company's most significant source of revenues by a wide margin each year. Macau is the top grossing gaming jurisdiction in the world. As I indicated last week during the uh, suitability hearing last Monday for MGM, to understand concerns surrounding gaming operations in Macau, it's important to differentiate between pre- and post-1999. It has been widely acknowledged that in the 1990s, Asian organized crime groups known as triads became prominent in the junket operation of Stanley Ho's casino monopoly. Triad presence remained high through the 1980s and the 1990s. 
In the period 1995 through 1999, large-scale violence erupted between rival Macau-based triads vying for the lucrative gaming operation market, junket operation market, and its related activities. During this period, Hong Kong-based triads also moved into the area. In December 1999, pursuant to a treaty between Portugal and China, Macau reverted to Chinese sovereignty and became a special administrative region of the People's Republic of China. Casino gaming remained legal in Macau while e illegal in the PRC. China took strong measures to curtail triad <laughs> violence, including dispatching its army and executing and imprisoning triad members. There was an, an immediate and drastic drop in violent crime. Since 2000, a period in which there has been a dramatic rise in gaming-related revenue in Macau, Macau has continued to experience a significant decline in violence. Nonetheless, concerns about organized crime persist, and I expect that the applicant today will address their approach to those concerns. In 2001, the government op opened a bidding process for three gaming concessions. Those concessions were granted to SJM, owned by Stanley Ho's company, Galaxy Casino, and Wynn Resorts. Currently, the Macau regulatory in the Macau regulatory structure, there are six autonomous licenses operating 35, approximately 35 of these uh, uh, casinos. Of these licensees, uh, there are three U.S.-based: Win, Sands, and MGM. I also discussed the great gaming promoter system in Macau last last Monday, and indicate a significant portion of the gaming market is composed of high stakes. Patrons from the PRC who almost exclusively play Baccarat in dedicated VIP gaming rooms. VIP gaming rooms are well-appointed suites generally located within a large casino that provide luxury accommodations and privacy, privacy exclusively for gaming by top-tier gaming patrons. The gaming promoters rely on a network of collaborators comprised of junket operators, sub-junkets, and agents. The structure resembles a pyramid as you go down the chain. Because this lower level network is not subject to licensing and vetting, there's an increased risk that criminal triads or other unsuitable persons may infiltrate or resume a foothold in Macau's casinos through this collaborator network. In Macau, it is the role of the gaming promoter, not the government, to determine mm -hmm. the suitability of the gaming promoter's partners. Win Macau currently has 12 gaming promoters. The promoters are solely responsible for bringing customers to their respective operation. Win Macau supplies all of the game personnel, such as dealers and game supervisors, as well as security personnel and surveillance monitoring. The cage, or financial center, is oper operated exclusively by employees of the gaming promoter under the surveillance of Win Macau and the DICJ. Only the principals and owners as disclosed on the licensing application are subject to vetting and licensure by the DICJ pursuant to regulations in Macau. Win takes steps. Uh, uh, above and beyond those required by the DIC regulations by performing background checks on those employees of the gaming promoters working at the Win Macau Casino, including the anti-money laundering coordinators and those employees who operate the financial cages in the gaming promoter rooms. Win, Mal Win Macau advances commissions to the gaming promoters, and the gaming promoters in turn advance credit to the customer through the collaborator distribution system. Win Macau is not involved with the gaming promoter to customer credit issuance and collection process. Therefore, Win Macau has no corporate knowledge of what interest rate of any is charged or the manner in which debt collection is undertaken in jurisdictions that do not recognize gambling debts as legally enforceable obligations such as Macau. IMB investigators reviewed the due diligence process that Win Macau uses for gaming promoters. Did note that investigators seldom, if ever, include interviews with the gaming promoters themselves, although personal, in, personal interviews are conducted uh, at the level before it is, re, is forwarded um, to corporate investigations. When negative information regarding junket personnel or activities comes to Win Macau's attention, the company's approach is to refer unsubstantiated or unverifiable information as well as unconfirmed intelligence to the DICJ, the Nevada Gaming Control Board, or other appropriate agency. Win Macau is fully Pardon me. Win Macau is fully compliant with DIC's regulatory requirements and is further detailed in the report has at times gone above and beyond <coughs> DICJ's requirements. Investigators also reviewed the anti-money laundering policy at Win Macau, as well as their procedures for politically exposed persons, which are compliant with regulatory requirements. Additionally, Win Resorts has a foreign corrupt practices policy prohibiting payments to foreign government officials. 
Overall, the applicant was cooperative and provided the information requested by investigators. No issues were discovered by the investigation that would disqualify the applicant entities or natural person qualifiers. As such, the IEB recommends that the Commission find the applicant WinMass LLC suitable, subject to the following condition. That the applicant should satisfy the Commission at a hearing that the applicant's business practices in Macau meet the statutory requirement of responsible business practices in any jurisdiction. Accordingly, we are here for the hearing today. Thank you. Any questions? Response? Commissioners? I have none. And I think we will proceed to an introduction by uh, presentation by the applicant. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the applicant would like to call four witnesses in the following order. Stephen A. Wynn, founder, chairman, and CEO of Wynn Resorts. Kim Sinatra, general counsel, Wynn Resorts. Jim Stern, senior vice president, Wynn Resorts in charge of corporate security. And Jay Shaw, senior vice president, legal and general counsel of Wynn Macau Limited. Matt Maddox, the president and chief financial officer of Wynn Resorts uh, is again with us here today and available to answer questions. So our first witness will be Mr. Wynn. Thank you, Governor. First of all, can you hear me all right? I can. Yes. yes. Yep. Fine. It's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> In the interest of moving this procedure along and not taking any more time than is necessary, but yet meeting our requirements, surely the most the most pressing issue in these, in these moments is suitability. These moments of suitability would be our sensitivity to compliance and the way we run our business. <clears throat> We've been doing this, I have, for 47 years. The company is known as Golden Nugget, that became Mirage Resorts, and then subsequently Wynn Resorts. During that period, I've had, since I was 25 years old, I've had the chance to develop a fairly advanced sense sensitivity to the kinds of things that are required of people in our business. It isn't rocket scientists. It doesn't take, doesn't take an enormous amount of imagination. It just takes common sense. Gaming is a business that is unique. I mentioned earlier in, in a conversation with this commission, and, and I've done so publicly, that we in this industry have sort of a presumption that we need to prove that we know the difference between right and wrong and we know how to conduct our business ethically. I think that that presumption is due to the, the unsavory and colorful history of gaming as it was conducted illegally earlier since the depression and bootlegging days and through the early days of Las Vegas. I'm, I'm, I'm fully sensitive to that. And for the past 45 years, I've dealt with that as best I can. And most importantly, learn to be anticipatory, anticipatory in understanding what would be expected of us and the kinds of things that would occur after the fact in questioning about our behavior at earlier times. In that regard, when we entered our, our business career, when we started in China, which is, of course, <laughs> the most interesting subject, knowing very well about the history of our industry, the sort of you need to prove that you're worthy kind of mentality that was out there, we were entering a new market in Macau. Our history in, in Las Vegas had been exemplary, spotless in every regard. We had been in business in New Jersey. We had never received a negative vote in all the years, wherever we were. We had nothing to prove and nothing to explain in terms of our past. But going to China represented a very interesting moment. I knew nothing of China, like most Americans. And Macau had a very, very funny reputation. It was Dodge City in many respects. I, I was aware of it. We had dealt to Hong Kong customers in the Mirage and at Bellagio. We had known about Asian business. Caesar's Palace had a lot of it early on in the 70s. And now here we were with an opportunity to participate in the market. And we were lucky enough 
I was to receive the first concession. They were giving two new ones, one to Stanley Ho because he had all the employees in the buildings, but they were going to create two new primary concessions under the aegis of the People's Republic of China following the turnover in 1999. A new chief executive had been appointed named Edmund Ho. He had been educated in Canada. His family had started the first Chinese bank in Portuguese Macau called the Taifong Bank. He was a highly respected family. He had been involved in the legislative activities of Portuguese Macau and was named the first chief executive. And the, com the community had decided to expand the horizons of Macau, to take the tackiness out of it and to make it a touristic and convention and entertainment destination worthy of dominating Asia. Those were the decisions that were taken. And in that regard, they were going to have new concessions. We were lucky enough, there were 20 odd applicants, then they made a short list and then they, we got on the short list and finally they published the scores of the companies that had made their presentations in the South China Morning Post. And we were miles ahead of everyone else and we got the first concession. That was the beginning of our history there. Early on, it occurred to me that if we were to maintain our reputation, we were gonna to have to handle this entry into Macau with a great deal of circumspection and a great deal of thought. So when we put together our organization there, I went to a friend of mine who had been the director of the FBI and had just retired during the Bush administration, Bush, Papa Bush. And I asked him, I said, look, we're going to China and I need to navigate some complicated waters and I'm totally inexperienced in such things. I don't speak the language and I don't have any chance really of second guessing the complexities of that culture. What can I do for help? He said, I've got a guy for you, Steve. He's the FBI has never been allowed to participate outside the United States until after 9-11. But because of the threat of terrorism, the FBI has been given a new brief. They now are opening offices around the world to make liaisons with all the law enforcement and intelligence people around the world to protect Americans. The FBI assistant director who was in charge of this is a man named Larry Mefford. He's the one that's opened all the offices around the world. He's the most experienced international intelligence guy the FBI has ever had. He's just coming up for retirement. I'm going to introduce him to you. And I hired Larry Mefford, who you met last week, because he's a new employee at MGM. I hired Larry when we were in construction, and I sat with him, and I said, Larry, you're fresh out of the FBI. I remember he had a brand new passport, other than the one he used as a policeman. I said, Larry, we came here together during the very early days, before we even broke ground. I think, no, we were in construction, but for very early days of construction in 04, and we opened at 06, I might point out, at Labor Day of 06. And I said, Larry, how are we going to figure out who we're doing business with here? He said, good question. He said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go recruit a guy that has worked on organized crime and all of the shenanigans in this part of the world at the Hong Kong Police Department named Lyle. And we recruited this fellow, Lyle, who MGM mentioned last week. One of my employees in the early stages was Grant Bowie, who you met last week. <clears throat> so Grant Bowie met Larry Mefford with me while we were in construction. And he met Lyle, Jim Lyle, while we were in construction. I recruited those men and put them in place to do background investigations and to understand, to understand the way it worked over there. Who was unacceptable? Who was a term I like to use, radioactive, which meant we couldn't touch him? And who was OK? And in this world, things are not black and white. Frequently, there are different shades of gray. And in China, the word triad was a word that in America was, had become synonymous with mafia or Cosa Nostra. That was not true, and it is not true today that those words are synonymous. The triad started off as political action and, uh, and, and uh, dissension groups. And it was a short hop, I guess, if you're a, a political dissension group under Mao Zedong. 
to get involved with other criminal or, or unlawful activity or prohibited activity. So some of them engaged in loan sharking and uh, drugs and other criminal activities like prostitution. But all kinds of people in China were involved or touched triads. So triad became a word that was front and center for us. <clears throat> what, what did it mean if someone was associated with a triad? Did that meant that we couldn't have anything to do with them? Or were there some people that were okay and others that were not? And it came to pass in my education by Mr. Lyle and Mr. Mefford and others that were recruited that if someone was engaged in unlawful activity or they belonged to an organization that engaged in unlawful activity and they were engaged in unlawful activity, they certainly were disqualified from doing business with Wynn Resorts or Wynn Macau. But being, having, having some association with the triad in and of itself was not a disqualifier. On that basis, we began. But again, the key to compliance is anticipation. Thinking in advance, having a modicum of, it in, of, an, of a imagination to know what people will expect when they look at your history. And so when we started making investigative reports of people with whom we did business, we turned those investigative reports from Mr. Lyle and Mr. Mefford. We created a structure where their information went directly to our compliance committee. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. One of the other advantages we had is that Wynn Resorts went public in 02 and was a company created after Sarbanes-Oxley was passed by the uh, Congress, which meant that all of our structure or cor uh, corporately was done after Sarbanes-Oxley and so included all of the safeguards that were instituted in the securities business following the Enron scandals and such things. So we, we had a very uh, anticipatory kind of structure and, and very definite areas of compliance and responsibility that were built into our corporate structure. But I fixed it up with Mr. Mefford and Mr. Lyle that their line of reporting would be direct apart from management, directly to the Compliance Committee of the Board of Directors, chaired by Governor Robert Miller. Now, that was another point. When we created a, a compliance committee pursuant to Sarbanes-Oxley in our new company, we did it with some anticipatory imagination again. Governor Miller had been the only two-term elected district attorney and prosecutor in Las Vegas. His father had been a casino person. So he came from a family familiar with gaming and deeply acquainted with Las Vegas. But he was the prosecutor in Las Vegas, the district attorney for eight years, and then the president of the National District Attorneys Association nationwide in the United States. Then he became lieutenant governor. And when, uh, when Dick Bryan left the, the, uh, as governor to become a senator, he did two years of Dick Bryan's term as governor, and then with huge popular majorities, eight more years as governor himself. So at 10 years, the longest sitting governor in Nevada history up till today. And then during Clinton's administration, the chairman of the National Governors Association, a man of unquestioned integrity, total experience in gaming and prosecution and criminal affairs. He became a chairman of our compliance committee from day one of the existence of this company. And I arranged with my colleagues for Larry Mefford and Jim Lyle and the whole security apparatus of the company to support, to report directly anything that they discovered about people we did business with, people we rejected, people we accepted, went to Governor Miller. And then in the summer of 06, before we opened the hotel in Macau, before we commenced operation, not after, I instructed that all reports from Mr. Mefford and Mr. Lyle, up or down, good or bad, would be given to the Gaming Control Board of Nevada. There was no requirement to do so, but I understood that we would be subject to after-the-fact judgments, that we'd be called upon to explain things in hearings like this one today. There was no guarantee that we would answer every question perfectly, because to quote President Kennedy in his inaugural address, here on earth, God's work is done by men and therefore must necessarily be less than perfect. But I bring up this story 
and I, I take your time this morning to put some context into the history of this company, Wynn Resorts, that's been public since 02 and that I started in 2000. And it's consistent with the 27 years at, at Golden Nugget, which became known as Mirage Resorts, that was merged into MGM at the, at, in 2000. These practices are not new. They're not recent. I've been doing this for 47 years. I must say I've had good days and bad days on this job. People who seek to trick people, to connive or to misbehave, they have unlimited resources to find new ways of doing it. We pretty much stay ahead of that. But I have to tell you that in the years that I've been in Macau, and that's now since 01, and having been in this business for 47 years, I am thoroughly impressed with the energy, the integrity that has been brought to bear in Macau by that government and that regulatory agency as they've dealt with the most historic expansion in the history of civilization. Between 2002 and, to, and tonight, this morning, revenue in Macau went from two or three billion to 45 billion this year. Think of that, commissioners. $45 billion from, six, from less than five billion in 10 years. What an, there is no comparable experience in the history of recorded civilization to the expansion, the job creation, the economic activity that's taken place under that government started by Edmund O and currently administered by Fernando Choi. And to give you an idea about the government of Macau, Fernando Choi, the chief executive officer of, of that country, company, got his bachelor's degree in California in public health, then went to the University of Oklahoma and got his MBA in public health, and then he did his doctoral thesis in public health at the University of Oklahoma. He got a PhD. He wrote his doctoral thesis on the HMO in 1983 when it was a new thing. This is the quality of leadership in Macau today. These are very serious people who fully understand the challenges that, that are presented by their expansion. But I have to say that it's the squarest place I've ever been. The people are wonderful. I am very proud to be in Macau, and that's going to be the subject today. And one of the reasons I was so glad to be part of this procedure is I want to make sure that I make a record of how proud I am to be in Macau and what a great job I think they're doing because everything that's said here today will be in the South China Morning Post tomorrow. Everything that happens in the world, the world has shrunk. And Boston, now that, now that gambling is legal in Massachusetts, there is this giant worldwide community of regulation and exchange of information that's taking place. And everything that happens everywhere is known by everybody else. When Larry Mefford, came to me in 07. He said, you know, Steve, all those years in the FBI, my wife and I have always dreamed of being in Europe. I've been offered a terrific job because of this terrorism threat. Barclays Bank in London are worried about their worldwide uh, anti-terrorism protection. They contacted me through a headhunter, offered me a tremendous salary if I will take charge of Barclay worldwide, their banking anti-terrorism for their branches. I love it working for you, but my wife just wants two years in London. Don't, you won't feel bad if I take advantage of it. I said, no, Larry, that's great. He said, but I won't leave here till I get you somebody better than me. He said, you know my background, but there's a guy that's a friend of mine that's coming up for retirement, that's in charge of the FBI in Asia. Asia, and he's bilingual. His name is Jim Stern. He can take my place and do a better job than I can, Steve, and I'll go off to Barclays, and my wife will have her two years in London. I said, sure. Jim's here today, and he'll be glad to talk to you about China and the things that he does and how we operate our business. But I want you to know the key to compliance is anticipation and common sense. But I don't think that any executive in my business can stand up and say, that with all that money moving around every second, 
that anybody can keep track of it. Not 100% perfectly. But the issue is, do we allow illegal activity in our casinos? The answer is no, no. Do we do everything that you can reasonably do to stop it? Yes. And I don't believe that casinos have criminal activity all the time, everywhere, by any means. And I'm here to say that. I'm also here to answer your questions, introduce my colleagues. Oh, one other point. There's a sensitivity to problem gaming here in Massachusetts. Part of running our business is to be sensitive to problem gaming. My father was a compulsive gambler and died broke because of it. It's a painful thing for families. I was the first, I was on the first board of directors of Rob, Dr. Robert Custer's Institute of Pathological Gaming many years ago and supported it financially. And I got my education from Dr. Custer, who's the seminal, who's written all the seminal work on the subject. Problem gaming is like any other compulsive activity, drugs and alcohol. It destroys families. It affects a percentage of the population of the world. In gaming, Dr. Custer measured it was about one and a half to two and a half percent of the population that are susceptible to this form of compulsion. But like alcohol and drug abuse, gambling abuse and its treatment depend on one essential fact. The victim has to recognize the problem and voluntarily decide that they've had enough of it. That's the secret to the treatment of this illness, according to all the experts. With that in mind, we are able to spot such people rather easily. If you're in my business, it's not hard to spot someone who's got a problem gaming. And we've always taken action about that when we see it. There was a man whose last name begins with W. Gambled when we opened win. Kept playing every single day. Asked for more and more credit. A very, very wealthy man. A multi-millionaire. Worth close to a half a billion dollars. He applied for and got a credit limit of five million dollars. He kept a villa at the hotel and came every week. <clears throat> he would win and lose a million or two million dollars a trip. And he would, if he owed us money, he would pay promptly. We watched this for a few months. My colleague, Mark Shore, came to me one day and said, I, I don't need to say his name here in this hearing today. He said, this individual, Mr. W uh, is back. I said, yeah, what else is new? He said, Steve, owes money in three other casinos. We gave him $5 million, he's now 15. I don't think we should go any further with this guy. He's got all the marks of what you and I call a compulsive player. This is about the hundredth conversation I've had of this sort with this guy over a period of years, my, my colleague. He said, I want to pull the plug. I said, of course. I said, we, uh, we don't need to be part of this anymore. This is all wrong. As a matter of fact, I'll deal with it myself. I know the customer. I picked up the phone while we were sitting there. I asked my secretary to call Casino Marketing, asked if they had his cell phone, got him on the phone. I said, look, um, we appreciate that you've come here and given us all this business. And you've been a gentleman to our employees. You've handled yourself in a very professional way. But I have to speak honestly to you. This, it looks to me like it's out of hand. And I don't want to be part of this anymore. The company doesn't want to be part of this anymore. I want you to pay off the $5 million. And I want to tell you in advance that we're not going to, we're going to cancel your credit. I don't want to be part of financing this anymore. You owe money all over town. That's not healthy for you. And it could be embarrassing for us as well. 
I know that you're upset. He said, look, at, look, what, what is it? You have no right to tell me how to behave. I'm 50 odd years old. It's my money. I've paid my debts. I said, I know, but you got a problem and I don't want to be part of your problem. So if you want to do this, go do it somewhere else. But if you want to play here, you play for cash, no more credit. And I'm going to deposit your checks next week if you don't pay your check, if you don't pay us. But I want to terminate the credit account. Well, he said, you do what you have to do. And he hung up on me. We, uh, we deposited the check. We got paid, of course. The player never came back again. He got buried by the opponents, by the competition. <clears throat> Ended up in an unsuccessful lawsuit. Uh, the company that gave him credit, sued him. His defense was that he was taken advantage of and he won. That kind of stuff, negative publicity about our industry occurs when casinos don't exercise restraint and maturity. But that restraint and that maturity is one of the things that the commission should take into account in suitability and trust us to run our business properly based upon experience. There are people that have applied for licenses here that don't have experience, but the only companies are like horses. They run true to form. People that have run their business properly for years will undoubtedly run their business properly going forward. So experience does matter as much as financial capability and all the rest, or good taste and design. Those are all important things. But taking care of the employees, using common sense, and looking, your, your investigators have spent a fortune, and they bill us for it, <laughs> to find out what we're like. What's our history like? And you know, and what we, what we ask is that you accept our history for what it is, a story of best efforts, not perfect. But I tell you that if you pick us to be in business in Massachusetts, we will do what we have done before, try our best. And we're here because it looks like fun. We do this because it's fun. We want to have fun building buildings, making people go wow. And if I, could, if I could dare to give some advice to the commission, I would say you should pick someone that looks like fun to you. <laughs> <laughs> Here's this is so true. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Mr. Wynn before we continue? Questions from council? The Bureau has no questions of Mr. Wynn. Commissioners? Uh, I may come back at the end. Okay. Not at the moment. So that person who talked about animals and kids never met Steve Wynn, right? My name is Kim Sinatra, and I'm going to try to go next. Um, my job here is to give you an overview of our compliance programs, um, both in the United States and Macau. A little bit about my background. I um, went to Wellesley College. I graduated in 1982. Um, I attended the University of Chicago Law School and graduated from there in 1985. I proceeded from there to become a partner at Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher in the New York office, and my specialty was real estate. Um, through that, I met Merv Griffin, and I represented Mr. Griffin um, as an outside lawyer and then as his general counsel um, in the early 80s and 90s. Um, I have been at Wynn Resorts for 10 years, um, and that little path brings me to you today. Um, uh, Jackie, if you could go to the first slide. So this first slide, while it looks a bit messy and busy, I think what it's reflective of, it is reflective of the incredible purview of compliance throughout our organization. As Mr. Wynn um, most eloquently told you, is that the idea of compliance is that it needs to be an essential part of your entire corporate culture. If one is to conduct one's business uh, with integrity and with an eth in an ethical manner, um, compliance becomes part of what you do. And it shows up in very many ways. Um, as Mr. Wynn also noted, is 
the key for us on compliance is to be anticipatory. We try to develop an infrastructure before we start um, an area of operations that um, equips us to identify problems to stop them from happening. Of course, being imperfect um, and dealing with imperfect people, um, problems will arise. And the hallmark of a good compliance program is being able to identify those problems and deal with them um, in a reasonable way. Um, the second way I would describe um, a good compliance program and ours is that it's dynamic, is while it is comprised of lots of boxes on charts, lots of written policies and procedures, and many job descriptions, is on a daily basis we examine ourselves. Are we doing a good job? Has anything happened that requires us to reform any portion of what we do? And while we have formal reviews, usually annually of most of our policies, um, and clearly annually of all of our people, to the extent that circumstances occur and, and things happen that, that maybe we don't like, um, our compliance procedures will be reviewed and, if appropriate, will be um, reformed. So let's take a minute to go through this slide. You can see at the top of the slide our parent company, Wind Resorts Limited, that's our public company with a market value of about $18 billion. It's traded on the NASDAQ under the symbol Wind. You can see on the left-hand side of the slide, we have two operating companies, Wind Las Vegas, which is 100% owned by Wind Resorts. And then on the right side of the slide, um, Wind Macau Limited, which is traded on the Hong Kong Exchange. We own 72% of the stock of that company, 27% of which is owned by um, public shareholders in China. The operations of our parent company are supervised by our board of directors, which you've heard about earlier. We have um, eight members on our board, six of whom are fully independent of management, the two inside directors being Mr. Wynn uh, and Elaine Wynn. Our board of directors is comprised of incredibly distinguished people. You've heard about a couple of them. Governor Miller uh, chairs our compliance committee and is our presiding director. Uh, among the other uh, independent directors are Ray Arani, who serves as the longtime chairman and CEO of Occidental Petroleum, Al Shoemaker, who served as the chairman and CEO of First Boston, and the longtime chairman of the board of trustees of the University of Pennsylvania. We're very proud of um, our board, and we rely on their direction and oversight uh, in the conduct of our business. You see below the board, CEO and management. One of the hallmarks and essential features of a successful compliance program is what the books will tell you is the tone at the top. I think that you probably got an idea of our tone at the top from Mr. Wynn's presentation this morning. You see the next box over from CEO and management is the Corporate Compliance Committee. This is the independent committee chaired by Governor Miller, uh, described earlier by Mr. Wynn. That committee um, is uh, also populated by Mr. Maddox, who serves as the president and CFO of the parent company, and John Strepp, our chief administrative officer um, of Wynn Resorts Limited. That compliance committee meets quarterly. It reports directly to the independent board of directors, and um, each meeting of our board of directors has a written agenda item for a report from Governor Miller with respect to the activities and findings of the compliance committee. The additional participants in those quarterly meetings include myself, our compliance officer, Kevin Turek, who is also the general counsel of Wynn Las Vegas, Mr. Shaw, who you'll have um, the opportunity and great pleasure to meet in just a few minutes, who is the general counsel of Wynn Macau, our head of internal audit, um, the executive director of Wynn Las Vegas's casino finance department, and our director of corporate compliance, who is a woman called Shannon Nadeau. Next to that, you will see um, independent auditors. Ernst & Young serve as our independent auditors. Due to our public company status in both the United States and Hong Kong, we are required to file periodic reports under SEC rules. Um, Ernst & Young is our independent auditor in both um, jurisdictions and has been able to render unqualified opinions with respect to our um, financial controls since inception of our company in 2002. We have a very robust internal audit department. That internal audit department, again, uh, pursuant to Sarbanes, reports directly to the audit committee and the independent chair of the audit committee, 
Um, so they are independent of management. Marcus Trummer, who has experience with um, one of the big, however many are left accounting firms, has been our internal audit head for approximately 10 years. Um, it, right below that, you see um, corporate investigations. You'll hear from Mr. Stern um, shortly. We have a disclosure committee, again, a creature of Sarbanes-Oxley. That disclosure committee is comprised of the functional heads of financial reporting, IT, security, surveillance, and the operating companies, in addition to legal. That disclosure committee is responsible for reviewing all quarterly reports and annual reports before they're filed with the SEC and provide accountability down through the organization for all of the public disclosure that is made. Um, you see next to the disclosure committee the compliance officer. That again is Mr. Turek. He reports directly to Governor Miller in his capacity as the compliance officer and has a direct um, reporting relationship to the board of directors should he remain unsatisfied with any of his interactions with Governor Miller. <coughs> Um, when we go down to the operating level, you'll see that at Win Las Vegas, there is management there and a full um, executive management team. There is a gaming compliance committee um, at the operating company level. The Win Las Vegas Gaming Compliance Committee is chaired by a very experienced gentleman named Larry Whalen. His title is Executive Director of Casino Finance. This committee meets monthly. It um, operates pursuant to a written agenda. And while it is responsible for assuring compliance with all of the regulations promulgated by the Nevada Gaming Control Board, it has, as a very large part of its function, is to assure compliance with the Bank Secrecy Act obligations we have, which is filing currency transaction reports <coughs> and suspicious activity reports under the aegis of FinCEN as enforced by the IRS. Under FinCEN and under our obligations under the Bank Secrecy Act, we are subject to a full audit by the IRS on our currency transaction reporting every three years. And what that means is the IRS, an entire team of them, move into the wind for anywhere between four and six months and tick through thousands and thousands and thousands of currency transaction reports that have been um, completed and filed by our organization. Um, we've just commenced our most recent um, audit, our last audit, uh, three years ago uh, was concluded with um, no fines being assessed and very minimal findings and was by IRS admission the most um, successful audit um, of our peers um, in Las Vegas. As we move over to Wind Resorts Macau, uh, there's quite a similar structure there which is management. There's a gaming compliance committee there that also meets monthly. They are responsible for making sure that all of the rules and regulations uh, promulgated by the DICJ in Macau are adhered to in the operation of Win Macau. And they also have, as a very, very large part of their portfolio, assurance that we comply with all of the currency transaction obligations um, in Macau, which are quite similar and mirror those in the United States. They are applicable both to us and to our junket operators. Um, that committee is chaired by the chief financial officer of Win Macau, a gentleman named Robert Gansmo. The other members of that compliance committee include our chief operating officer, our general counsel in China, um, several members of our legal and finance team, the casino controller, the EVP of casino operations, the gentleman in charge of cage operations, the director of surveillance, um, the executive director of gaming compliance, and the senior members of the internal audit team in Win Macau. Uh, there are U.S. participants who listen in on those meetings. They include myself, our compliance officer, Mr. Stern, members of my team, internal audit, and the compliance division. In addition to the Gaming Compliance Committee, there are two special committees in Macau that are necessary as a result of both regulatory requirements and the methods of operation. The first is the Junket Committee. The Junket Committee is comprised of Mr. Shaw, the president of Win Macau, and uh, the chief financial officer of Win Macau, as well as a member of security. Um, th that committee is responsible for approving background of junkets before they are accepted to do business with Win Macau and continues to supervise their operations throughout their relationship with us. 
There is also called the PEP committee, which notwithstanding its name has nothing to do with cheerleaders. Um, in Macau, we are required to um, review our entire player, player database um, for politically exposed persons, as they are defined under Macau law. There is a worldwide database that includes um, this list of people with, upon which are many government officials, Chinese government officials, government officials from other jurisdictions, as well as those who may appear on certain watch lists or prohibited countries. Um, so the PEP committee is responsible for identifying those people if they are either um, uh, credit customers of ours or, or junkets and um, taking any action that's necessary under the laws of Macau. Since, Jack, you can go to the next slide. Since corporate investigations and security is such an essential part of what we do in compliance, um, I thought it would be worthwhile for you to hear from Mr. Stern with respect to his organization and some of the tools that he employs in discharging his duties. Good morning, Commissioners. It's Good nice to be back. Good, Good, Good to morning. see you again. Good morning. Um, my background uh, prior to coming to work uh, at Wynn Resorts six and a half years ago, um, I was in the U.S. military. Uh, I was in the Army. I was stationed in uh, Vicenza, Italy uh, with 509th Airborne. I discharged uh, and went to college, went to the University of Southern California. Uh, I got a degree in international relations. Uh, I am bilingual. Uh, I'm a Japanese American. I speak Japanese. Um, I graduated uh, from college and I served 25 years in the FBI. Uh, 18 to 25 uh, years in the Bureau uh, was in the organized crime field. I served three tours uh, at FBI headquarters. Uh, all three tours were in the Asian Organized Crime Unit. Uh, I transferred 10 times in the Bureau. Uh, which was not fun, was, <laughs> but that's, that's the Bureau, that's the old Bureau. Uh, one of those assignments uh, was also as the FBI attache in Hong Kong, 94-95. Uh, again, I worked uh, Asian organized crime, organized crime for about 18 years. I was either involved directly as a supervisor uh, or uh, an undercover agent in probably the three most significant uh, operations in the Bureau um, in the 80s and 90s. Uh, Operation uh, Tropical Storm, uh, Crystal Thunder, um, and Royal Charm. I, I retired from the Bureau in 2007 as the Chief of the Asian Criminal Enterprise Unit. <clears throat> uh, I was fortunate enough to follow Larry Medford, uh, an FBI colleague of mine that Mr. Wynn referred to earlier. Uh, and I've been with the company for, again, six and a half years. In terms of the makeup of my department, uh, both in Las Vegas and in Macau. Uh, we have uh, hired the most experienced law enforcement officials, uh, both in Macau uh, and here in the US. Uh, we have over 300 years of law enforcement experience, both federal, state, and local. Uh, in Macau, as an example, uh, we've hired um, former rural Hong Kong police and Hong Kong police uh, super chief superintendents who have a background not only in intelligence, but uh, the Organized Crime Triad Bureau, the Narcotics Bureau, the Intelligence Bureau. They're very senior uh, law enforcement officials, retired, and they are now working for our company at Wynn Macau. Um, on the slide, Danny Lawley is the current Executive Director of Security for Wynn Macau. He has a staff of 14 investigators. Uh, from that staff, he's got over 150 years of law enforcement experience in Hong Kong, in the region, in Macau. Uh, in Las Vegas, I've got two additional retired FBI agents who work for me, uh, the former assistant agent in charge of Nevada, and also a very senior and experienced organized crime um, uh, agent who I hired about a year ago who uh, is also part of our, our makeup. We have, again, very, very experienced um, security staff both uh, in China and Las Vegas. And we, we take our job very, very seriously. Um, I can tell you in my 25 years in the FBI, uh, other than uh, the two years uh, after 9-11, uh, I've never been busier uh, in this job uh, in, my, in my current capacity. And I spent two years in Pakistan after 9-11, so I'm very busy. Um, 
just so you know, I want, I want to also um, touch on, before I get into the, the intensive background uh, checks, et cetera, that we do um, to ensure due diligence and uh, all the backgrounds that we do on all of our employees, our junkets, um, vendors, et cetera. I want you to hear about one of our security um, initiatives that we put into place, both in Las Vegas and it will be implemented in Macau um, after we, uh, in 2016, when we have our third property there, uh, the Wind Palace. Um, it's called the Trifecta, and the Trifecta is based on experienced law enforcement officials overseeing the security department. And what that does is it, 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 it focuses on experienced officials who have a specific skill set uh, in their discipline. Now, in Las Vegas, the trifecta is three individuals who have that skill set. The top person is a 30-year Metro uh, lieutenant named Dave Logue. He's the on-scene commander. And we have a clear bifurcation between operations and administration. The operations side is supervised by a very decorated and experienced Navy SEAL, Joel Beam. And on the administrative side is a career hotel security person who handles HR, et cetera. So we don't commingle the responsibilities. There's a clear distinction, and we delineate between operations and administration. And that's, that's our trifecta. Now, we're going to employ that also in Macau. Uh, it'll be a little bit different because our new property uh, will not be contiguous to Win Macau and, and Encore. It'll be, it'll be across the bay. But we'll have a version of that trifecta. And I also envision that trifecta here uh, in Win Boston, should we uh, have that opportunity. Getting to the intensive background um, initiatives that we have, I think they speak for themselves from World Check, et cetera. We're very thorough. Uh, all of our reports are sent to the regulators and the enforcement agencies. We do maintenance checks. We do them every six months. Um, we, in addition to the, the checks that we have access to, we also, because of our law enforcement background, uh, we glean and extrapolate uh, intelligence information from our law enforcement sources, et cetera. All that information is put into our reports. Um, and those reports were provided to your investigators. Are there any questions at this point? I no? Nope. Proceed. Okay, I'm just gonna take you. Oh, you have something to add. Do you want to do it now? Yeah. Okay. In a recent in, in, in observing Massachusetts Commission recently, because uh, <clears throat> your stuff is televised, right. there were some questions about the board of directors and management or the board's sense of self-consciousness. We had a situation in our company a couple years ago. Jim, one of our directors wanted to go in business in, in the Philippines, big stockholder, <coughs> name you're familiar with. I had always heard bad things about the Philippines, antidotally. I said, Jim, I, I, I don't want to insult a fellow director, but would you please use your resources and tell us about the Philippines? From the FBI and from Interpol and everybody, let's just take a look at the Philippines, like any other person in my position might say. Jim said, sure. I said, Jim, whatever you do, have it translated in Japanese because Mr. Okada is interested. And I want to give him the courtesy of understanding any position we may take and the grounds for such position. Jim went and did what he had to do, hired independent investigators, used his sources, and wrote a very thorough report that, frankly speaking, was a great, great deal of condemnation to the culture in the Philippines that, that, that tolerated a great deal of corruption on a political level. There was a suggestion that was almost the way things work there. Enough for us to say, we're not interested in the Philippines. Mr. Okada, read this, 
we did this for you. You're the largest shareholder of this company with me. We had 25 million shares apiece. You know, we don't need this. Read this. Hi, 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 Steve Sun. Hi. Well, when we got going, it wasn't enough, and Okada kept going. And Okada started using our names on the internet. And it was going to be a joint venture that we were going to go to Philippines. I objected very strenuously, told Mr. Okada he had to cease and desist from that activity. And in one of our board meetings, which is all in your investigative reports, we asked Mr. Okada, are you going to go in business in the Philippines? He said, yes. An independent board meeting that day of the outside directors, <coughs> Governor Miller said, the other guys aren't comfortable. He's got to go. Okada had made a remark in a board meeting that when we told him about the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and how you couldn't do business in the Philippines because of the FCPA, Okada in the board meeting actually made a remark to the effect that in Asia it's different. You can use middlemen, it won't show. Blood drained out of the face of all the directors at the table. And the independent directors instructed me to get rid of Okada. We couldn't do that. In, the, in Macau, we could get rid of him by vote of the other directors, by vote of the other directors, but in America, you had to have a special meeting of the shareholders. You had to get two thirds of all the shares outstanding to remove a director. An embarrassing, time consuming, humiliating experience. We said, Mr. Okada, if you insist on going to the Philippines, you can't be on this board of directors anymore. You must resign and go away. Let me think about it, he said. I don't want it to be your idea. Don't throw me off. Let me think about it. He said this at a quarterly board meeting, the same day that he made the very incriminating remark about middlemen. We had simultaneous translation for this fellow at the board meetings, people in another room, like at the UN, so that each of us could talk in English. He could hear it simultaneously. He could talk to us, and we could hear it simultaneously, just like the UN. We had the translators there, so Kim Sinatra and I sat down with Okada that night and told him he had to go. He, he answered me, let me think about it. It'll be my idea. Don't throw me off. We waited a month. We called. We waited another three weeks. We called. It was clear that Okada was not going to do it. We got to the next board meeting, which took place 90 days later. And in the board meeting, I said, Mr. Okada, do you intend to go in business in, Japan, in, in the Philippines? Yes or no? He said, yes. We said, thank you. At the conclusion of the meeting, Mr. The Governor Miller ordered Ms. Sinatra to engage in a full-scale investigation of Mr. Okada's activities in the Philippines. We hired Louis Free, the director of the FBI, the youngest man ever appointed to the bench as a federal judge in American history and the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, and finally Director of the FBI for President Clinton. Louis Free conducted an investigation that revealed myriad violations of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, a, a virtual horror story. We published this in an 8K when we received it on February 18th, two years ago, in an 11-hour board meeting. We first saw the investigative report on February 18th in an 11 hour board meeting and he went through it page by page. On that day, we excluded Kasuo Okada from our board of directors. We redeemed his shares, but we could not exclude him. We had to go through such gyrations according to Nevada law. The board of directors is entitled to create an executive committee with the full power of the full board. The board of directors under Nevada law must meet at least once a year. In order that Okada not have any further contact with the events, the affairs of our company, we excluded him as a shareholder, redeemed his shares pursuant to our bylaws in Nevada law, and then on the spot reorganized the board of directors in Las Vegas to put the entire board as an executive committee Everybody became a member of the executive committee except Okada so that we could conduct our business 
without him having any access to our affairs. We did that until we conducted the shareholders vote and 99% of the shareholders voted to remove him. But my point of this long-winded presentation is that the minute that we knew about this guy, we reorganized our board so that he could not be anywhere near us. That's compliance. That's what you do when you have a real strong sense of how to run the business. If you've got the good fortune of having the information at your fingertips on which to act. I wanted to add that in this to compliance conversation about boards of directors. Thank you. So um, continuing on, just so that you have the information, is we've got a list in front of you of all the different um, regulators with whom we interact on um, a regular basis. We have the SEC and NASDAQ as a result of our public company status in the U.S., the Nevada Gaming Control Board, the, the Department of Justice and IRS, as we talked about, um, DOJ with respect to FCPA and, and other items, the IRS with respect to Currency Transaction and Bank Secrecy Act. FinCEN is also under Bank Secrecy Act and OFAC um, under uh, currency handling. We switch over to Hong Kong and Macau. We have a very similar setup, which is the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and its um, enforcement, the SFC, the DICJ, which is the gaming regulator, yeah. the, uh, the gaming regulator in Macau. The Financial Intelligence Office is also another regulatory agency in Macau. It is specifically responsible for um, currency transaction reporting. You'll see those reports referred to as HVTs or ROVs. I noticed last week they were talking about them. And a lot of that has to do with language and uh, translation. In addition, it's really important, Jim talked to you about what our internal resources are on security and surveillance. Um, in Macau, both the Judiciary Police and the Public Security Police, one is uniformed and one is not, maintain a 24-7 presence inside our casino, as does DICJ. In addition, Nevada takes some jurisdiction over our operations in Macau by requiring us to file quarterly reports um, upon which we are required to report any violations or any other adverse action that has occurred in connection with our operations outside of Nevada. Um, if we go on to um, AML, anti-money laundering compliance, you can see in um, the U.S. we have currency transaction reports, and that's sort of a black and white issue. If there's a cash transaction um, in excess of $10,000, you owe the report. It's applicable to all patrons, includes foreign currency, and is rep reported within 15 days to the IRS. Suspicious activity reports are also mandated under the Bank Secrecy Act. They are discretionary and require us to um, exercise uh, our uh, supervision of currency transactions within our casino. And to the extent that our staff or cage is, uh, is suspicious that um, uh, a Transaction may not be as it seems. One of these reports is filed within 30 days of the transaction. We undergo extremely detailed and continuous training with respect to CTRs and SARs in the U.S. as well as in Macau. Um, uh, all employees are made aware of these requirements and the people who are responsible for implementing and administering uh, these reporting requirements are received extensive initial training and annual training in both places. Um, in Macau, you can see the high value transaction report is very similar to a CTR. The threshold is larger. It has been since um, implementation of the law. That $10,000 number hasn't moved or been indexed by the US government for, I don't know, 20 or 25 years. Um, in Macau, Currency transaction reporting is applicable to all patrons, including junket players. Junkets are primarily responsible for um, filing HVTRs with respect to their players. However, we are secondarily responsible for that under the law, so we do training of the junkets. In addition, the government does training um, through uh, the financial office um, of junket uh, 
administrative staff, and each junket is required and has nominated a, an AML um, contact person with whom we liaise on a daily basis. Um, summary reports are submitted to the DICJ. Suspicious transaction reports, again, same, uh, same deal is that they are um, discretionary. They apply both to ourselves and to junkets, and they are submitted to the Financial Intelligence Unit. Um, if we go to the next slide, this is a summary of some of the most um, material of our compliance programs and policies. Um, I noted that in Nevada, the FCPA is, is left off that list, which is of paramount importance. We have been doing annual training on Foreign Corrupt Practices Act for many years, both of hundreds of our employees and of our board of directors. Um, we also do FCPA um, compliance training at Wind Design and Development, which is responsible for construction and procurement, as well as at Wind Macau for our marketing staff and procurement staff. In addition to that, we have anti-money laundering, the gaming compliance program. The self-exclusion <coughs> program you see limited there relates to problem gaming. Um, it will be required in Massachusetts as well. It enables a player to come in, fill out some paperwork, and say, please don't give me credit or market to me. Um, we have a uh, myriad of company policies, all of which have been reviewed by the IEB. The, the master of all of those is the company code of conduct and business ethics, which basically sets the tone. We have department procedures and training for all compliance areas. There are monthly and quarterly meetings of our various compliance committees. There is reporting both internally and to our board of directors as well as to our regulators. In Macau, you can see on the right side of the slide a very similar infrastructure with some additional um, areas like PEP compliance, OFAC compliance. Um, Macau actually has um, stiffer regulations in some areas than we are subject to in the United States. Um, so are there additional uh, policies and procedures that um, we go through in Macau? We have um, consistent company policies. Um, starting with the company code of conduct, there are some additional policies applicable to Macau, including our junket background policy. There is as much um, training um, and uh, compliance meeting and reporting <coughs> in Macau as we have in our US operations, and many would argue um, probably more extensive. I'm going to turn um, the mic to uh, Mr. Shaw to review um, uh, a little bit about uh, our junket operators as well as um, the compliance and security uh, that is relevant to our interaction with our junket operators. Jay. Uh, good morning. Um, good morning. Nice good morning. to be back in Boston. Can you you can hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Here and back. Yep. Okay. Uh, a little bit of background about myself. I'm um, Jay Shaw. I'm the general counsel of Win Macau Limited and the senior vice president of legal at Win Resorts Macau, the operating company there. Um, so I graduated from Colorado College in 1995 and took a joint JD MBA program at Tulane University. Which I graduated in 1999. I then spent about seven years in private practice, almost all of it with Skadden Arps, uh, the last couple of years in their Hong Kong office, doing all of the work for the Wynn Macau initial 2004 <coughs> financing, where I met Kim and Matt and Mr. Wynn and other members of the company. Um, I went in house with Wynn in 2006, and uh, I've, I've lived in Asia now nearly a decade, and the better part of eight years of that in Macau with a lot of frequent flyer miles to Las Vegas and now Boston. Um, uh, our legal team in Macau is uh, three Portuguese lawyers and myself and some administrative staff. We have all been there since before opening. There's been zero turnover, zero attrition. We work with every department in the building. Um, in recent years, our focus, as you'd imagine, as with every other company doing business anywhere, has been compliance. I used to be a finance lawyer, and now I think I'm a finance lawyer. Um, so I am uh, the main contact, I think, for, for Kim and Jim and Matt and, and everyone else in, in Las Vegas for compliance in Asia. And I, I spent a lot of time in early mornings on the phone with, with Kim and Jim five or six days a week. Um, 
I'm going to take you through a few things, a junket overview, very brief, because I'm sure you're all very familiar uh, with the junket operation system in Macau now. Uh, junkets organize uh, player trips to Macau casinos, and they extend credit and collect money from those players. Um, there are over 200 licensed junket operators in Macau. Some of them are publicly traded and incredibly large with thousands of employees and dedicated compliance departments um, with dozens of employees in those departments. Some of them operate at you know, the vast majority of the properties in Macau, and all six concessions or subconcessions do employ the services of junkets. Um, they facilitate about 60% of the Macau gaming revenues. Um, that's public information. Um, in terms of economics, casinos pay commissions to the junket operators, and the junkets get working capital either from some form of advances from casinos, which is the system that Wynn uses, as you know, and investments from public and private sources. Um, junkets are licensed and regulated by DACJ, and the license process is extensive. The application is very long and detailed. It goes through shareholders, family members, businesses, banking relationships. Um, it, it's what you would expect out of a full uh, gaming license application. Um, the DICJ, in conjunction with the Macau Police, run full criminal background checks, and licenses are only valid for one year. So there is sort of a mini renewal process every single year, and then there's full relicensing every three or six years, depending on if the license holder is an individual or a corporation. Um, the DICJ also, this isn't on the slide, puts the junkets through a nearly continual audit, as they do with us. The majority of these audits focus on anti-money laundering, related items, um, the quantity and quality of their high value transaction reports, the structure and layout of their compliance departments, the training of their compliance officers. Um, <coughs> this is, is a focus and when we undergo that audit, the junkets are selected and, and undergo that audit at the same time. It's generally two times per year and has been intensifying over about the last three or four years. A win puts junkets through additional backgrounding procedures. As, as Jim went through, he, he showed you what we do. Um, it's a fairly intensive background check. We used to update them annually. We now update them the last three or four years semi-annually. That was at the request of several of our board meetings, and we felt it was a good idea. Um, those reports go to our gaming regulators in applicable jurisdictions. Um, our junket contract has largely been the same since 2006. It's um, fairly short and sweet and fairly strong in our favor. It has always contained an FCPA representation. It has always contained an obligation of the junket to adhere to the law in anything that they do, whether on or off of our property. It has always contained our ability to terminate them virtually instantly if we found a suitability issue with them. And it has always given win full control of their operations in our building, from where they operate, how many tables they get, the staff they get, the table limits, um, so we, we keep a fairly tight hand on them. Um, and we also have mandatory training for all junket employees before they start with us. Um, in addition to going through full criminal background screening, and this is down from their tea lady to the person who runs the operations of WIND, they get a background check, and we reserve the right to not allow their employees on our property before they start. <coughs> we train them all in AML, and those junket employees who have a, a compliance role or a cash cage role get extra training and that training is mandatorily refreshed every year. And our internal audit group, as well as the government, makes sure that that training is uh, given to every employee on, uh, before they start and on an annual basis. And to finish up our affirmative presentation on compliance, I just had a couple of random thoughts on, on this last page. One of the most important things about compliance is that it isn't within a silo. And I think one of the things it that isn't, it isn't um, what I didn't hear you say. It, it, oh, a silo. Okay. A silo. I'm sorry. Uh, one of the things that um, became apparent um, is that uh, on Friday for us is that cooperation between the regulator and the regulated is essential to getting to the place where you want to be. Um, and so we have an ongoing dialogue and a cooperation with our regulators on, um, on every level. And we generally take that 
as a principal to principal. Um, you won't find layers of lawyers and outside advisors to talk to, although we appreciate them very much. Um, you won't find them um, fronting for us in, in your interactions with us. Um, we generally like to show up and be accountable um, for our actions. Um, uh, the chairman of our Corporate Compliance Committee, Governor Miller, goes to Macau at least once a year. Um, he meets at that time with the head of the DICJ as well as the chief of police um, and other senior law enforcement um, agencies directly because he wants to be sure that he's not hearing filtered information um, through management. And so he finds that to be very helpful. He also goes um, and meets annually with the regulators in Nevada to talk about um, whether or not we're doing a good job as a company. And he reports that back uh, to the full board um, of directors. Nevada um, has uh, begun a very, very positive outreach um, with the DICJ. Uh, I think that one of the things that maybe IEB has, has found, and I would encourage all of you, is that the gaming regulatory world is relatively small. Um, I think that people who operate in that world as regulators get a lot of benefit from talking to one another. They get to share information about all of us, and they get to share information about issues that they may be seeing in their jurisdictions. Um, and so Nevada, I think, was out last week meeting with DICJ um, because they've got three of Nevada operators working in Macau, and so they want to make sure that they, that they have a good, open uh, communication um, with the DICJ regulators. Um, we participate in industry roundtable discussions. Um, the topic du jour is anti-money laundering and compliance in um, the U.S. and abroad. Um, as you can see, FinCEN has been very, very active um, with Las Vegas operators. Um, we always want to make sure that we have sort of best-in-class policies and procedures, and we keep on retainer outside experts in those areas to advise us of changes that are happening, changes either in attitude or changes in regulations. And so I think with that, I can conclude our affirmative presentation on compliance, and we're available for your questions. Thank you. Um, we sort of did all the witnesses at once rather than one by one, but I think that's okay. You can manage your questions. but. Um, why don't we take maybe just take a quick break before we get into the next round? Excuse me. There was a raised hand there. Sorry. No, I, I had a couple of questions, Mr. Chairman, but I'll do it after the break. Okay. Thanks. Sorry. I didn't see that. All right. Why don't we uh, reconvene? <laughs> We will uh, pick up, um, I do just want to make sure, I think this is clear to everybody, just make sure everybody has a heads up, particularly up from uh, the Wind Resorts group. We will break for lunch around 12, um, and then at 1 o'clock we will be convening. The commission has a special session that hopefully won't more than be more than about a half hour from 1 to 1.30. Are you familiar with this? No. Okay. Um, we, we have a, something we have to do from 1 to 1.30 in a separate meeting. So we won't, we won't readjourn, um, reconvene this uh, in session until give or take 1.30. So you want us back at 1.30? Yeah, thereabouts, yeah. I, I thought you knew about that. I'm sorry. There's just something else we have to do to get out of the way before we reconvene this meeting after lunch. Is that all right? Sure. <laughs> all right. Uh, okay. Mr. Mackey? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe Governor Weld had, had a couple uh, of I'm going to wave those until after. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Sinatra, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Is the... I can, but I don't know if anyone else can. <laughs> okay. Is this mic on? Is it yep, working yep. okay? Okay, great. Uh, uh, I'm going to... I want to focus this morning, Ms. Sinatra, on uh, the uh, due diligence performed by Wynn in connection with this acquisition of the property in Everett. Sure. Uh, and just to, to set the stage, I understand that uh, in this likely your first involvement in that acquisition, that you flew to 
Boston with Mr. Maddox at some point in November of 2000, 2012. Is that correct? 2012, correct. Okay. Was it just the two of you, yourself and Mr. Maddox? That's my recollection. Okay. And at that time, you met with uh, Mayor DeMaria, and, then you toured, and you also toured the site? De Maria, but yes. Oh, excuse me, uh, Mayor De Maria. And then shortly after that uh, visit, Wynn signed a, a memorandum of agreement or a letter of intent with respect to the potential of entering into a more formal option agreement? That's correct. Okay. And I, and I believe the date of that it was November 27th. Does that ring a bell? That's my recollection. Okay. Now, uh, the prior to November 27th, the execution of this, uh, we call it preliminary document, the memorandum of agreement, when performed some due diligence in connection with uh, the current ownership of that site. Is that correct? That's my recollection. Okay. I can, maybe it's helpful. Is it helpful for you if I sort of give you an overview how in a circumstance like this we would approach the due diligence, or do you want to just ask Well, let me, let me just focus in, and then to the extent that you can't remember and your practice would be useful for us to hear, that would be great. But okay. let me just ask uh, uh, some further questions here. So uh, do you have the report in front of you, the redacted report that's been entered into evidence as Exhibit 4? I do. Okay. Uh, page 61. Okay. Uh, and there's a paragraph in the middle there that begins with, in addition. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, in addition, the IEB investigation also confirmed that in November 2012, the applicant performed some in initial due diligence on the sellers. They confirmed that the three identified sellers, that is, Loans, Gattinari, and Denunzo, were in fact the owners as listed on legal documents, et cetera, et cetera. Do you, do you see that? I do. Okay. Does, does that refresh your recollection at all about an, an initial due diligence exercise in November that was just limited to determining the ownership of the property? Again, it's a general recollection. The I know that Dan Gaquin, who was the real estate partner at um, Mince Levin, pulled the Secretary of State um, filings for this LLC that was our contract counterparty. It identified all of Lonis, Gattinari, and Denunzio. It was consistent with our experience as well because the first we met with Denunzio um, on our first trip uh, to Everett, and um, at either that meeting or ve one in very close proximity, we met Mr. Lonis. Okay. So that it would have been, if I understand your answer, it would have been Wynn's practice to at least look at the Secretary of State filings for the LLC which owned the property. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Do you recall what those uh, filings with the Secretary of State's office showed at this time in November? I'm not sure that I ever looked at them personally, but I was advised um, by Gaquin um, that they were Lonis, Gattinari, and Denunzio. Okay. Are you aware of whether uh, Mr. Uh, and by, by the way, who is Mr. Gaquin? Uh, Dan Gaquin is a partner at the firm of Mince Levin. They have been representing our company for some number of years in our activities in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Okay, thank you. Uh, did Mr. Gaquin, uh, and did he communicate directly with you, or was it with another person at Wynn that he he worked with? He was working with many of us, but he, he would have communicated that to me most likely. Okay. Uh, did Mr. Gaquin tell you in November of 2012 uh, how far back in time he went with respect to the Secretary of State's filings? No. Okay. Did he... Do you know if he, uh, did, did Mr. Gaquin communicate to you that he had reviewed all of the filings for the uh, LLC which owned the property? No, but I wouldn't have expected him to either. Uh, did you know at the time in November how old this company was when it was found, when it was founded? No. Let me uh, just draw your attention to 
to exhibit number nine, which uh, is hopefully in the containing the documents that I gave you. Probably That's the, very the one you handed document. me this morning. Correct. Okay. Uh, and just for the purposes of the record, this is the uh, annual filing for FBT Everett Realty LLC with the Secretary of State. And the date at the top, it reflects it was filed on February 15th, 2011. Uh, do, do you have that document in front of you? I do. Not, okay. And it reflects on the second page of the document the uh, underline eight three current executives of the LLC. Do you see that? Well, I guess I would object to your word current, but it has. I, I'm sorry, as of the time it was filed. Sure. Uh, pardon me. Okay. And those people are Gary DeSico, Paul Loans, and Dustin Denunzio, correct? Okay. Do you recall at this time in conversations uh, with uh, Wynn's attorney any reference to Mr. DeSico? This is back in November of 2012. Oh, there were none. Okay, there were none. Thank you. Uh, now, if I could draw your attention, to, well, let me back up just a second. At this time, again in November, any further investigation done of the three owners or really was just I, just to determine who the current ownership was? So this is where I'm going to have to tell you a little bit about practice. So when there are a couple of things that are going on at the same time as um, our initial conversations with the FBT um, Everett uh, owners is that um, we are negotiating formal documentation, which includes a very extensive due diligence um, on all matters related to the acquisition. And we included, as we reviewed on Friday, our um, privilege license um, language within the contract that required both cooperation with our own internal compliance um, efforts and with the any regulatory inquiry that may come with respect um, to the land. And so the way that, that diligence is dynamic and continuing and so it often begins with a phone call from either myself or Mr. Turek to uh, Mr. Stern's group. And if something is going relatively quickly, as this contractual relationship was going, um, Mr. Stern has the ability to do sort of a preliminary um, public records type of review, which would, imbue, which would involve criminal records, property records, whatever they could pull up on the computer, which would be completed within a relatively short period of time. And we could receive a, an oral report about. Um, and it, the transaction's going to go forward or continue. That's generally followed up by some kind of written document that comes anywhere from three to six weeks later. OK. So that would be consistent with what's in the report on page 61, an initial review, and it was likely just of Secretary of State filings, correct? It may have been, yes. OK. Uh, now let me draw your attention to the document that we've marked as Bureau Exhibit 5, which is, uh, for the record, a December 14th, 2012 article in the Boston Business Journal. Uh, and the headline of the article is, Everett Casino Site Could Be a Gamble for Win." Do you? I see it. Oh, you do. OK. Uh, now. Um, do you recognize this document? I do. I've seen it many times um, since December. It's been of immense importance in the investigation. Okay. Uh, is it a document that you recall you saw in December when it was published? I, I likely saw it in December. I don't have any current recollection since I see so many things. But I do remember that the journalist, either the day or two before he wrote the article, called our company with his theory. Okay, so this is uh, this is Mr. Moore called. Yes. Okay. And do you recall? Uh, do you recall that conversation with Mr. Moore? What he said? What you said? I actually didn't talk to him personally. He he reached out to PR, so he would have talked to someone in Michael Weaver's group. Okay. asking for a comment. Since it had to do with the Everett Project, uh, Michael called me to say, hey, do you know anything about this? Okay. Uh, did, did, 
Do you have, let me just ask you this again so the record is clear. Do you have uh, a recollection of reading this article on or about the time that it was published in the in the I BBJ? don't remember particularly. I've okay. seen it so many times since. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you could uh, turn to page two of the article. Sure. Uh, and right in the middle of page two, there's a reference, there's a, a one sentence paragraph. Uh, if wins Everett Casino proposal gets past Monsanto, Menino, and Tebow, it may still face a final obstacle in Gary P. DeSico. Do you see that? I do. Okay. Uh, do you recall hearing Mr. DeSico's name uh, in connection either with uh, the reporter's outreach to win or reading it in this article at any time in the month of December? Oh, it was in the initial outreach because it's a name I had never heard before. So when you say it was in the initial outreach, what? With what the conversation he called, as I found Boston to be such an interesting place. The media is very, very interested in lots of what's going on with respect um, to your potential new industry. Um, and frankly, we get a phone call two or three times a week with a bunch of cockamamie um, theories. This, this particular article has three theories. One, this is impossible because it's so overly polluted, you'll never be able to do it. The second theory is, oh, and by the way, it's in Boston, so you'll never be able to do it. And the third theory is, and by the way, there's a bad guy in there. And so I will tell you, and I don't mean to be flippant about it, but our company has endured over a year of maligning and potential maligning of our integrity, our directors, our operations, and I think a few people in this room are sort of getting the idea of what it feels like for having cockamamie theories called and um, tried out on you as, on a weekly basis. But I will say that the first time I heard Gary DiCicco's name was in the context of an article. Some of the things were retreads, which was it's in Boston and it's overly contaminated, and some of which were new. Okay. Well, let me... Uh... You described it a, a few minutes ago this uh, <coughs> November document, which is the memorandum of understanding yes, sir. that ultimately led to a formal option document that you executed with the owners of the property, correct? Yes. Okay. And that more formal option agreement uh, was executed on uh, December 19th, 2012. Does that? Correct. Okay. So here's my question. When that, and, and who signed that document, by the way, on behalf of when? On behalf of? Of, of when? I believe Mr. Maddox did, but okay. I'm not looking at it. Okay. Now, at the time that Mr. Maddox signed that document on December 19th, was anyone at when? And, and, well, let me ask, were, were you aware uh, that there was this story in the Boston Business Journal that Mr. DeSico may at one point, may at one point in time have had an ownership interest in the property? Yes. Y you were aware of that? M okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, did anyone at Win suggest that the uh, that article, the linking of Mr. DeSico's name with this property, uh, cause Win to do some further due diligence before it signed the option agreement? Well, so this is how it went. Um, the a uh, journalist called and tried on his various theories um, with Mr. Weaver. The new one was, again, this allegation of Mr. DeSico. We had no knowledge of any involvement with Mr. DeSico, so we called Dustin Denunzio, who, who was our contact with the sellers, to say, gosh, we got this funny phone call. Who's Gary DeSico, and is he part of your deal? He said he that... Uh, DeSico was not an equity owner of um, the deal, and they actually gave a written statement to the journalist to that effect, and I think the journalist actually received it because he writes, Dustin Denunzio told me that DeSico's been out since January of 2012. Okay. And well. so the, the article resolved the issue about whether DeSico was in or out, consistent with our current understanding, and so it frankly didn't change our due diligence. Our due diligence was commenced and in process. Um, it didn't change uh, what we were doing. Okay, so if it'd be fair to say that the first you heard 
Mr. DeSico's name was around the time this reporter called, so that would have been a few days before the December 14th story, correct? That's my recollection. Around there. And then the option agreement, the formal option agreement, was executed on December 19th, correct? Correct. So in that interim, what I'm asking is, was there any further diligence done by, but done by anyone at Wynn in connection with Mr. DeSico particularly? There was not particular diligence done with respect to DeSico. The overall deal in investigation was continued. Okay. Now, uh, you're anticipating where I'm going because I want you to turn to the next exhibit, which is number six. Uh, and Mine aren't numbered, so if you could tell me what it oh, is. Oh, Bureau Exhibit 6. It's a, it's a huge page that says redacted on it uh, with an email that begins at the very bottom of the page. No. From Dustin Genazio. Yes, that, okay. that's right. Uh, do, you, do you recognize that email, Ms. Sinatra? I see it now. I don't have a, I get hundreds of them every day, but I have no reason to disagree with it. Okay. Now, this email is dated uh, January 17th, 2013? Yes. Okay. Uh, and it, it's, it's an email from uh, Mr. Denunzio to you, uh, and it starts with Kim. I assume that you received the quote that was sent to the Boston Herald. If you want the party line to be changed at all, please let us know. And then the next paragraph begins, per our conversation, below are the three people who have an interest in FBT, Everett Realty. Do you see right. that? Okay. Uh, it says, per our conversation. So what conversation was this? Is, is this the one you were just referring to where you called Mr. Denunzio and asked for further information? I don't remember. He refers to a conversation. I've had many with Mr. Denunzio. So you don't remember what prompted the conversation with Mr. Denunzio? I don't. And he's referring to a different publication. So I don't know if this relates. This, he's referring to the Herald. And so there is this other phenomenon, which is, I call it piling on. So I think, I don't know if the Boston Business Journal was sort of first on this, and then it, the Herald took the bit and it got passed on. I don't really recall. They, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of pages of media on these issues. Do you recall in the conversation that you had with Mr. Denunzio, at least it's conversation referenced here, do you remember anything about that conversation? Again, you're trying to, to and I don't mean to be picky with you, I'm sorry, is that there isn't a particular conversation. He's referring to one, but there were many, several, whatever, over the course of a period of time. Okay. Do you recall around this period of time in January, uh, Mr. Denunzio saying anything to you about Mr. DeSico? No, the conversation we had about DeSico was quite definitive, which is DeSico's not in. We're prepared to tell, the pu we're prepared to make that statement publicly, which they did to the Boston Business Journal, and the Boston Business Journal believed him, at least okay. enough to report it that way. Okay. Did so that's that was what Mr. Denunzio was quite definitively telling you at that point in time, correct? Yes. Okay. Did you ask Mr. Denunzio what happened to Mr. DeSico's interest? Uh, no. Uh, did you ask Mr. Denunzio whom Mr. DeSico had conveyed his interest to? No, I didn't. I was interested in who the current owners were. Did you ask Mr. Denunzio, or did anybody at Wynn, to your knowledge, ask Mr. Denunzio for documents that reflected Mr. DeSico's transfer of his interest? No, I did not. Okay. And then, uh, okay, so you, Mr. Uh, Denunzio on January 17th sends you uh, this document that we've marked as Bureau Exhibit mm -hmm. 6, correct? Okay. Uh, do you recall uh, what you did with this email once you received it. Did you pass it on to anybody? I don't know what I did with this particular email. Did you, at this point, with the information you were receiving from Mr. Denunzio, ask Mr. Stern, for example, to investigate further the current ownership of the property? We looked at um, the current owners and 
we, I actually did ask Mr. Stern to do some diligence about Mr. DeSico to see who he was. Okay. Uh, okay, that's helpful. If you could turn then to exhibit number uh, Excuse me, uh, exhibit number eight for a minute. It's not numbered. Describe it. You're going to uh, have to describe it. Uh, okay. Right exhibit number eight is the uh, document Mr. Sinatra we showed you this morning, which, correct. Uh, well, hold it up again. Yes, correct. Uh, okay. This is, uh, uh, for the record, of. Uh, uh, report of an internal corporate investigation done by Wynn uh, on or about January 21st, 2013. Do, do you have the document in front of you? I do. Okay. Uh, do, have you seen this document before? I'm not sure that um, I have seen it before, um, but it's in the usual form of our reports. Okay. And it, it reflects uh, a corporate investigation performed by Wynn, or at least that that someone at Wynn was asked on January 21st, 2013 to perform, correct? Well, it's interesting because when he handed it to me, I figured he had a reason for it. And I figured that the reason was the January 21st, 2013 date. Um, so the way that it works, I don't think the request was made on January 21st. I actually think that the date of the report is probably January 21st, but I'm speculating because the way that we do it is that there is an oral request, an oral report, and then generally a follow-up of a written report. And frankly, if there's no adverse information, I may not see the final report. It may go directly to the compliance committee. Now, you said if, just a minute ago that what was important to win at this point in time was the fact that Mr. DeSico was out of the out of the deal. He was no longer an owner of the property, correct? correct. Okay. So there's an investigation performed on January 21st, 2013 by Wynn of uh, FBT Everett LLC, which is the seller, correct? Okay. And then uh, three key executives, Mr. Denunzio, Mr. Loans, and Mr. Gattineri, correct? Correct. Okay. And it reflects that the, the resources used during the investigation encompassed government sources, private sector databases, media articles, and other confidential sources. Do you see that? I do. Okay. Uh, but the report is only uh, directed at the current owners of the company, correct? Correct. Okay. Do you, do you have any reason to believe, and I, again, maybe this is a question that's better directed to Mr. Stern, uh, why there is no reference in the body of this report to the Boston Business Journal article that appeared five weeks previously. Yeah, I think I think uh, Ms. Sinatra explained that we backgrounded um, the current owners of the property, and that's what we did at that time. It was documented as such. Okay, but it it also appears that you were attempting to background FBT Everett LLC. Is that correct? At least that's what the front page of the investigation report says. It was the, the three individuals that were backgrounded at that time. Though the first... I think, I think, not, you're, I think not, you're reading too much into the vernacular on this. The, the individuals who were backgrounded per our protocols were the current owners of the property. Um, and we did use all the uh, resources that, that we had access to um, now, again, we're not law enforcement, so we don't have subpoena power. We don't have some of the traditional things that I, that we can use, um, you know, when I was in law enforcement. But we did uh, uh, our due diligence checks on the current owners of the property. Would, would that due diligence check have, have included, for example, a Google search on the three individuals identified? Would, it, would the due diligence check? Yes. Well, we don't always depend on Google. We depend well, on... I should say an internet search. Well, our resources are such that I think they were explained in that prior slide. 
Um, we look at the individuals, what their history is, um, and those individuals, again, were the individuals who currently own the property. So you don't have any recollection, Mr. Stern, of in connection with this investigation, whether it was the three individuals or the company itself, of you generating in any information whatsoever related to Mr. DeSico? I don't have that recollection. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, Ms. Sinatra, uh, this uh, investigation was done in January 2013, and then I want to take you forward in time. You, you uh, testified on Friday that you received an email from some of the investigators that were working on this matter. I, I believe you said in July 2013 related to the ownership of the, of the, of the Everett property, correct? That was my recollection of the time frame. Okay. Do you recall uh, between January 2013 and July 2013 any further diligence work at when related to the uh, the ownership of the Everett property? I do not. Okay. Do you, do you recall any curiosity at this point, at any point between January and July 2013, about what had happened to Mr. DeSico's interest in the property? No. You testified on Friday, I think you said that you were, you used the word shocked, if I'm not mistaken, to learn that there might be some hidden ownership interests in the seller entity, uh, FPT. I was surprised that it was beyond some of this scurrilous reporting. Um, the investigators had been incredibly thorough. And so when they came to us and talked to us, um, they actually, at that point in July, did not tell us what they were able to tell us in November of this year um, that culminated with, our, with us coming to some resolution with respect um, to this uh, issue. But they indicated, and I believed them, that they had some serious concerns about the credibility of people who had been appearing before them. The, the scurrilous reporting you're talking about, is that the Boston Business Journal article? It didn't stop. I mean, if you would like to do a Google search, you can find a lot. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Boston Business Journal article, though, simply said that Mr. DeSico had previously had an interest, correct? Right. Okay. And we know, as a matter of fact, that that is true. Correct. And in Okay. In fact, that's reflected on the Secretary of State's website. Correct. Okay. Uh, you were, do you recall being asked a series of questions, uh, well, let me step back a second. After you got this email in July, uh, our uh, the Bureau's investigative team uh, flew out to Las Vegas and they did an interview of you. Do you recall that? I do. It was a sworn interview. And you were asked a series of questions, I think, at that point about, uh, to summarize it, you know, why uh, you uh, were not especially interested in learning <coughs> about uh, Pre the previous owners of FBT Realty. Do you recall those questions? Again, I don't want to pick on you, but I don't think to say it. I wasn't interested in it. It's that did I think it was necessary? What our compliance requirements were was to understand with whom we were doing business, and um, we can. I'm happy to answer all of your questions, but I think that maybe. Judge McHugh said it best, it's awfully hard if people are running around and not telling you the truth and being credible with you that it's, it's awfully difficult. But we had not had any of those conversations with the sellers. And we were unaware, frankly, of the IEB's investigation with respect <clears throat> to them. Uh, you said in your sworn interview, uh, and it, I'm going to, I'll give you a quote from it, but you have it in front of you. so. If you doubt me, you can read it. 
when asked these questions by by our investigators about uh, wins, uh, you know, not not being particularly interested in previous owners, your response was, I'm quoting, a licensee, meaning when in this case, is responsible uh, for the entity or the person with whom they have a commercial relationship. Do you recall that answer? Um, I don't specifically recall the answer, but there's a transcript. OK. Is that, is that a statement you would generally agree with, though, that the licensee is responsible for the person with whom they have a commercial relationship? Yes. OK. So what if those people with whom you have a relationship have associations with people who are uh, convicted felons or otherwise have an unsuitable background. Is that a concern of yours? It would be a concern of mine, and it would be within the purview of our um, security and um, investigative team to determine how far they go with those quote-unquote so, quote associations in which are real and relevant to the commercial relationship at hand. Yes. If I could just have one minute. Nothing further. For all of the all of the witnesses, I, I do have some additional questions just, of Mr. Just, Stern. Uh, okay, all right. Let's 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 hold right now. Go ahead, Governor Weld. So, Ms. Sinatra, you told uh, Council Blue on Friday that you had not encountered uh, this behavior pattern before of uh, counterparties being less than forthcoming with you concerning their ownership of what they were selling you. Do you recall that? Generally. So it's correct that this was an unusual and even surprising situation, the, uh, the back and forth with the sellers? The back and forth with the sellers was surprising to me, yes. And a negative experience, I take it? Yes. And did you institute any new procedures as a result of that negative experience? Well, as um, I testified earlier, our compliance program is dynamic. And uh, when you're dealing with people who are not going to be forthcoming and are going to lie to you, sometimes difficult, no matter how strenuous and arduous you work on your compliance programs. But I will say that um, uh, we have, our company is engaged in a very high volume of development-related work over the past 18 months as we pursued both this project and the project in Philadelphia. Um, we ran through our general compliance uh, requirements with respect to both of those projects. Um, but since our tussle with the FBT folks um, and the amount of time it's taken both for the IEB and for this commission to sort of get happy with that, um, we have um, taken a very hard look at our development activities, and we have instituted some additional pieces of paper and checks and requirements um, that maybe would help us um, in this sort of uh, this sort of circumstance. It's made it really hard for ad agencies and printers in Boston to get paid um, because we have an, we actually have a new process where unless the compliance is completed with respect to any vendor or material contract, um, the check request can't go through. And so we have um, a couple of additional signature blocks um, before payments are processed in the development area and hoping uh, that the frustration is worth it. Development, referring generally to real estate development? Well, I use development very broadly, and it's basically new jurisdictions. I think that one of the things that hopefully the commission and the IEB will find is as um, a sophisticated level of, of gaming, hopefully, is conducted within the Commonwealth, is that vendors and people will get used to what the requirements are. And they will know how to fill out the forms, and they will know that they need to be notarized by real notaries, and they will know that they can't participate and they will be caught if they try to horse around with either the IEB or with you, and that you take it very seriously, um, that will discourage people from trying to horse around with you. 
or with your operators. And so I think as this rolls out, and if you get the right operators, and you maintain the um, assiduous nature and the rigorous nature of what you're doing here, that I think it gets easier because people figure out what is and is not acceptable. That's all I have, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, other questions for? Do we need to take a break? Uh, Mr. Wren looks like he's uh, tired. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's okay. He's okay. Thank, thank you, thank you, Jim. Um, do we have other questions for um, Ms. Sinatra? You have, uh, Mr. Mackey, you have other questions for no, other witnesses? I, or? I do have questions of other witnesses, but. Okay. Um, so I'll hold. I mean, you have a question, but I'll hold until Mr. Right. Mackey's. Okay. I was, I was going to shift gears at this point to talk about some of the issues related to Macau with Mr. Stern, if that makes sense. Okay. Others, commissioners? Stevens, Zimbica, you're. I have some, and I'm not quite sure where they go, but let's, at which line this, but no, go ahead and let's okay. see where we Just give me up. one minute to switch gears here. Mr. Stern, good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? I can. Okay. Uh, uh, as I understood your, uh, I just want to ask you a couple questions about the team you have on the ground in, in Macau. Uh, it, it sounded like from, the, from this morning's PowerPoint that you had an investiga investigative staff there in Macau with uh, is, is it with 14, 14 people, 14 investigators, or is that the entire staff? It's the entire staff. Okay. Uh, but that staff includes uh, experts in particular on, on uh, Asian organized crime? It, inc it includes experts on Chinese organized crime, not Asian organized crime. Okay. Uh, and uh, includes a, a former Macau police detective, correct? It includes four former uh, Hong Kong police detectives. Uh, and the, the director of the staff is a gentleman named Danny Lawley, who is also a former Hong Kong police detective. Yeah, he's the executive director of the uh, corporate investigations and Win Macau security. Right. And I take it that one of the primary responsibilities of this group is to, to try to determine whether there's possible criminal influence of the triads uh, in the gaming prom promoter system, correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, I just want to ask you a few questions about uh, the background vetting of the gaming promoters. Uh, and I, I'm just, I'll describe to you the process and then you can correct me if I, if I get it wrong. It, it starts, as I understand, with uh, uh, application to the to the DICJ a gaming promoter has has to be licensed correct that's correct okay uh, and then assuming they have a I mean nothing can happen if they're not licensed right you couldn't do business with them well there's there's a step after that step oh no I understand there are many steps in fact but but just as a threshold matter you can't you can't even start unless they're licensed by the DICJ that's correct okay and then from there if <coughs> If a gaming promoter wishes to do business in a in a VIP room at your hotel, uh, uh, they uh, they let you know that in some way. I don't know if they submit a written application or is it just an expression of interest orally or how does that work? There's an application process. Okay, that's different from the application that goes to the DICJ. In other words, they yeah, generally they'll. Uh, 
they're, they'll be known in the market. It's hard to get into our property. We haven't added a new junket in as long as I can remember, at least probably a year. And the gaming operations and, and other people who, who deal with those areas for us will be aware sorry, of which Excuse junkets. me, just be sure you speak to the mic. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. They'll be aware of which junkets would like to come operate with us. And the junkets will express that interest. And if we have the space and if people are willing to deal with them, then they would go through the application procedure, <laughs> both with DICJ and ourselves. Okay. And just to back up a little, because um, I, I just wanted to let you know that we don't take sort of unsolicited over the transom, hey, I want to be a junket at the win. Um, the, this is a very serious process. And um, anybody who makes it to the formal investigative process has been vetted and recommended by the marketing people in our organization. Okay. And, and I take it before, you know, again, just sort of these additional steps, uh, if they, they're licensed by DICJ, they submit an application to you, again, assuming you have room and assuming they've got a, a decent reputation, uh, and then you do a, a pretty extensive records check, correct? Actually, part of that, the DICJ also conducts a full background investigation on the applicant. Okay. So that's, that's step number two before they're cleared to the next process. All right. And then, as I understand from the report, at least, they're interviewed uh, by the chief financial officer at Wynn Macau, a woman named Linda Chen. Well, uh, Linda Chen's the, the chief operating officer of Wynn Macau, and, and she'll be involved in junket selection when there is space and sort of vetting their reputation both uh, financially and suitability-wise before they, they move forward with okay. us. Did, did she conduct an inter interview of the gaming promoters? I, I, I can't speak for exactly what she does, but she will at a minimum be aware of their reputation in the market, both in terms of suitability and, and financial performance, which are the, in, in order, the two most important things for us. Okay. I do understand uh, from the report that no interviews are conducted of the gaming promoters by your investigative team. Is that is that correct? You're referring to a face-to-face? -face? Yes. Um, unless there's an issue that comes up through the investigation. Uh, but if uh, the background is suitable, we do not do a face-to-face -face interview. Uh, why not? Because you have this team of experts there, including experts on Chinese organized crime, why don't you deem it appropriate to do a face-to-face -face interview of your gaming promoters? Well, we don't deem it appropriate or inappropriate. It's just not part of, part of our business protocols. And I, I, quite frankly, I don't think it's necessary, based on my experience. Okay. Uh, Mr. Stern, do you have the, uh, maybe you could borrow from Ms. Sinatra the copy of the redacted investigative report? If you could just turn to page 157. Uh, are you there? Yes. OK. Uh, the third. It's 158. It's 158. 158. So two different brands. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the th sorry. The third bullet uh, on Exhibit 5. Uh, the second sentence, uh, I'll just read it into the record and we'll have a discussion about it. Uh, it references the, th this, this bullet references the corporate security background investigations that you were describing earlier. Uh, is that a fair statement? Uh, earlier you, during yeah. my presentation? During your, during your testimony just a minute ago, we talked about the background investigation that you conducted on the gaming promoters? Yes. OK. And, uh, and it looks as if a, a, re a written report of some kind is prepared on a, on a gaming promoter candidate? Yes, we have the the initial investigative background report. And then as Mr. Shaw alluded to, uh, we also do maintenance reports, which are semi-annual. OK. And 
this document, Exhibit 5, uh, states that several of these reports, I'm presuming that means are investigative reports, identified persons of questionable reputation having some type of association within the junkets operating out of several VIP rooms at Wynn Macau. Did I read that correctly? Yeah, I think it, I think it says raw intelligence. Is that what you're referring to? Well, I'm just reading the sentence. And I'm trying to read the same sentence. Okay. So I believe it's, it means raw intelligence related to uh, our semi-annual maintenance checks. And I think what that shows is that we're very transparent in everything that we glean from our sources. However, we don't act on rumor or innuendo or conjecture. and haven't been the FBI when we when intelligence was a huge issue, and it still is, um, I take the same stance, is we don't overreact to things that are not substantiated as fact. I didn't do that in the FBI, and I don't do that for when. OK. Uh, would it be an overreaction, to use your words, if you have raw intelligence that's suggestive of a questionable association? and then follow up and ask the gaming promoter a question about it? <clears throat> to answer your question, that information is provided to the enforcement agencies and regulators who get those reports. They're active government officials who have the ability to vet that information that we provided them more thoroughly than us. Um, it's my opinion that they're in a position to get our reports and act on it, or act, ask us to further vet the information of which they have not done. Now, we've had these, these reports and these maintenance checks, now they're semi-annually now. They've always gone to both the DICJ, the Nevada regulators, who are experts in this area. Um, and they have, if they were to come to me and say, can you further vet this information, this raw intelligence that you're getting, that you provided to us, we would do something. Okay. But I'm not going to to uh, react or overreact on information or intelligence that's um, not substantiated, uh, that is conjecture in some situations. But I will report it, which we have done, to the people who need to know it. And those are the regulators, both in Macau and in Nevada. That's been the policy. And I think that's what I explained to the investigators um, that came out, um, and I, I was with them both in Las Vegas and in Macau. Let me let me ask you. One of the regulators you mentioned is the Nevada Gaming Control Board, the N N G C B. Is that correct? Are they one of the regulators that you that you report this yes. information to? Yes. Okay. Does the N G C B have any staff on the ground in Macau? As far as I know, they don't have staff, but they do on-site inspections. Um, they're obligated uh, both uh, statutorily and also internally their own policy to do on-sites. In fact, they were just there last week. They do it on a routine basis. They have an expertise uh, in uh, Asian matters. And um, of course, we also provide it to the DICJ. Okay. Does Let me let me just stick with the Nevada Gaming Control Board for a minute. Uh, I understand, and I may have this wrong, and actually maybe, Mr. Shaw, you can help on this, that the Nevada Gaming Control Board actually cannot get access to any of the gaming promoter applications with the DICJ. Is that fair to say? Well, if you're talking about the actual application form, that's a proprietary form promulgated by DICJ, and it is between the junket promoter and the DICJ. While we internally get a copy of this for our own background checks, it is not our place to give it out. And we were specifically directed by the head of the DICJ not to. So we respected that wish. It's just simply not our form to give out. But we do provide our reports to the Gaming Control Board redacted for data privacy. But given the fact that our reports are largely proprietary and produced from our own sources, there isn't a lot of redaction. We might redact a picture or a passport number, but the guts of the report will all be there for the regulatory agencies. Okay. So how often, in connection with these 
corporate investigative reports that you submit to the Nevada Gaming Control Board, does the Nevada Gaming Control Board come back to you and say, uh, we're concerned about this, we're concerned about that, we want you to follow up on this information? How often do you get those directives from your regulator? Uh, it's, it's seldom, but I can tell you that if they did, I would act immediately. Oh, okay, but when you say seldom, uh, can I can't you, think of a, I can't think of a situation. You I, cannot I think of a situation where they've ever done that. Not right now. No. Okay. Thank you. What a, what about the DICJ? Uh, you also submit these reports to them, correct? That's correct. Okay. Uh, on how many occasions has the DICJ come to you with expressions of concern about a gaming promoter? I don't recall any, but you also have to remember that the DICJ is the initial vetting authority of these people. So we don't know how many people have gone to them to be licensed and then want to put themselves out there in the market and have been turned down. So we're getting people who are coming to us who are likely already active in the market, but if they're not, they've at least gone through the, the vetting process with DICJ and the police agencies that DICJ uses. Okay. I'm going to add to that answer. If we turned in Governor Weld, could you move the mic? Oh, if we turned in a report to the DICJ, <clears throat> they wouldn't have to come back to us. They'd do directly investigate themselves. They wouldn't need us anymore. We've made this point clear. They wouldn't need to come back to us. They're right there. They have primary jurisdiction. They wouldn't need to come back to us. If we give them something that's provocative that we hear about, and ask them to check it out. If they wanted to check it out, they wouldn't necessarily share that with us. They just plain do it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Stern, if I could draw your attention to page 36 of the redacted report. Uh, in that paragraph uh, in the middle of page 36. Uh, if you read down, there's reference uh, to uh, a review by uh, gaming investigators of a specific uh, corporate security background investigative report. Do, do you see that? It's kind of in the middle of the paragraph. <coughs> okay. Uh, and it was an investigative report on one of Win Macau's gaming promoters. Uh, and, and it reflects that uh, in this background report that a, and I'm quoting now, a close associate of an individual identified as an alleged uh, I'm sorry, that the gaming promoter is a close associate of an individual identified as an alleged senior member of a specific triad group. Uh, did I read that correctly? Yes. And I take it that when uh, the Bureau's gaming investigators uh, came to Macau, they had an opportunity to interview an employee of this particular gaming promoter. Do you recall that? I do. Okay. Were you present during that interview? I was. Okay. Uh, and the employee was asked about this questionable individual's relationship with the gaming promoter. And the employee identified the individual as the gaming promoter's husband. Do you recall that? I believe they said common law. Co common law husband. I believe so. Okay. I, I don't remember that specifically, but I generally do. Okay. And then the next sentence reads, the employee identified this, in I'm sorry, uh, strike that. The next sentence reads, the employee further stated that the individual, that's the individual with the questionable association, is her, quote, big boss. Do, do you recall that? I remember those words. I do. Okay. Then, I think, you know, that was in translation. I was in the interview. The uh, employee in question was speaking in Cantonese, and she used the term Laoban, 
which one translation can be boss, but it can also be a matriarchal or patriarchal form of respect for someone. Um, we identified the person you're talking about in our report, that he was likely a close associate of this group. So to use the English term boss, it, it is not applicable in our meaning. You need to get into a Chinese sense. And she used Laoban, which could just mean he's a patriarchal figure in this organization somewhere. It doesn't necessarily mean he's at win running things, because he's not. Okay, The person who's on the license is. Okay. Uh, and, we, and we explain that to yeah. the Massachusetts investigators that we all got involved in this one, including me during <laughs> my investigation. So I'm going to help you out here. David Wong and the chief operating officer said, use that word. The person is a junket operator who may be sleeping with David Wong was in Beijing that day. That woman runs the junket operation every day happened to be the one of the only ones you didn't meet when you were there, your detective. But the woman that is the licensed junket operator is the licensed junket operator and runs it. She may or may not be sleeping with David Wong. That's not really important to us. But the reason that we know about this is because we pointed out that David Wong was involved. This was our investigative report given to the DIGC. That was us that did that. And that's how you know about this, and that's how come the detective found out about it. <clears throat> and at the time when I was asked about it, this, the question was, what would David Wong be doing? Why would that, that girl who was an employee of the junket operator know about David Wong? And I explained that David Wong and folks like him could be involved with the junket operation in a number of ways. They could be a stockholder of the public company. They could be involved as part of the financing syndicate because these guys have tremendous amounts of money on the street. And like a mutual fund, this is our form of American Express, the junket operators, the card. The David Wong could have been part of the financing syndicate that puts the money together and gets paid a certain amount every month for financing the float of the junket operator. A guy like David Wong could have been involved, as he is in so many of the junket operations in town, in the collection aspect of it or in the financing aspect of it. So that's what that story was about. So we all know about that. So we, we, can, we can deal with it really specifically if you'd like. But remember, you got that from us. We turned that information over to the DIJC. They didn't find that up about us. We brought that up I'm, so that they could go check it out and tell us what they thought of it and whether we should follow through on it. I, 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 I hear you I, ask the I sequence be, of questions, and, and I thought maybe we could get right to the heart of the matter. Okay. Well, Mr. Wynn, what I'm interested in, and let me direct this question back to Mr. Stern. Uh, obviously, I don't, I don't speak uh, Cantonese, and I don't know what the specific facts are related to this individual's association with this uh, triad group. What I am interested in is your response to the interview that took place with the gaming investigators where this employee uh, described the relationship with this person with the uh, questionable associations. You, do you recall getting an email inquiry from the gaming investigators in uh, in Actually, it was this month, December 2013. There was some follow-up on this issue from our investigative team. Yes, and my email response is, I think, in the record. It quoted in the, it's quoted in the report. Yes. Okay, I just wanted to ask you a couple questions about that. Uh, you, you said in the first sentence, we update our contracted junket reports semi-annually. And those are those reports that you've, you've already testified about, correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. And then you said, and no extraordinary work has been done as a result of uh, employees interview in August of 2013. Do you see that? I, I'm just reading from the report. It's just just below that sentence. Okay. Okay. Did, did you see that? I, I actually don't. I'm just agreeing with you. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well, don't do that. Uh, the, in, the, in the block quote there where it begins with we update. Okay. I got, I got you on that. Okay. 
right. We update our contracted junket report semi-annually, and no extra, extraordinary work has been done as a result of employees' interview in August of 2013. That's correct. You said, okay. Uh, did, when you say no extraordinary work was done, what, what, what did you mean by that? That there was nothing further done to investigate this matter? So you, that's correct. Okay. Did one of your team of 14 investigators ask the gaming promoter about it following the revelations in that interview? There was no need. The employee you interviewed ran operations for that junk at Citywide, which probably means she ran five or 600 tables in 20 different casinos because the license holder was in Beijing that day, as Mr. Wynn said. So there was no need for us to because we know who the boss at Wynn is, and it's the license holder. And there isn't any need to go any further than our report already says, which says the license holder may have a relationship with the individual that you're uh, basing this line of questioning on. The next sentence of your email response, Mr. Stern says, our reports reflect that the individual, I'm presuming that's the individual with the questionable association, may possibly be associated with the, and redacted, with the junket, but there is no documented ownership. Did I read that correctly? That's correct. So I guess, is, would, it, would it in fact take some form of documented ownership by someone associated with Chinese organized crime to trigger further investigation? I don't know. What are you referring to when you say documented ownership? I don't well, understand. I'm just using the words that you used there. Okay, no, but what are in the context of this, are you talking about an arrest record, criminal history record? I don't know what you're referring to. Well, you, you used the words, Mr. Stern. I'm assuming that uh, the word, the phrase documented ownership refers to some document that reflects ownership of the gaming promoter that actually has the name of the person with the questionable association on it. Is that the threshold for conducting further inquiry? No. Okay. Well, then what would be? Well, so you, this was a meeting, or I'm sorry, this was the a result of an interview that was conducted by your people. And we answered a follow-up question via this email. There was no additional investigation required. We've been putting the results in the semi-annual reports for years. There's no reason to act on anything in this as a result of August 13th because nothing else had fundamentally changed, period. Okay. Mr. Stern, I understand. Uh, that uh, the DICJ has never uh, sanctioned uh, the Wynn Casino since it opened in September of 2006 for any regulatory violation. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Okay. And on an annual basis, well, strike that. Since, you know, for that same period of time, 2006 to the present, approximately how many regulatory violations of gaming regulators in, in Nevada cited you for? The numbers in the report, it's it's really quite small. So, okay. You can say it if you want. Okay. I, I, should the commission draw any inference from the fact that since the casino opened in Macau in 2006, there has never been a regulatory sanction from the DIC, DICJ to, to Wynn Macau? So I think it's a function of, of how the regulatory process works. Um, they are in our building every single day, 24 hours a day. Um, the failure to send people letters and assess fines does not mean that there's no regulation. They operate completely differently there. It's all oral. It's all oral. So you'll get a phone call that says, I'm worried about this or that. With respect to the anti-money laundering, there was a lot of work as between our um, compliance people, anti-money laundering people, a lot of training, a lot of auditing. It's just not their way to send you letters and, and assess fines. But you won't get your concession renewed if you're not doing the right thing. OK. That's all. All right. uh, Mr. Mackey, excuse me. Um, how much more time do you have in this? Because of our monocoque issue, we've got a time. 
can reconvene. Uh, we will be reconvening. So fifteen minutes, probably twenty minutes. All right. So uh, I think we better we better take a break. Uh, stop now. It, well, let me just make sure I'm right about this. At one o'clock, we have this brief meeting. Where's Director Day and Ombudsman Ziemba, right? Um, to talk briefly about the arbitration discussion, correct? Okay. At the end of the day. Yeah. Can we? All right. Okay. Is is there any reason why this has to get done at one? Since we posted it, we can start it at one and then do it later on. At, at the end. Okay. Well, we'll have to convene at one because we said we would, but then we'll postpone it. So I think we should. I think we should uh, take a temporary break now. Uh, we will have a quick lunch break. We'll come back here at 1 o'clock. We'll convene that meeting for a moment or two and then pick back up with you all and finish the win suitability hearing. So we're back here at 1. It, yeah, yeah, right. Okay, everybody clear on that? Thank you.